Hello, everyone. Welcome to Developing Palettes. I'm Aaron Loomis coming to you from the Drew Estate Studio. With me today is John McTavish from the Villager Scar Studios. How are you doing, John? Uh, I'm doing all right. I got the sunshine on me. I think one of the phrases you're probably going to hear more than once tonight, and maybe you drink, take a drink every time you hear it, is, man, I'm tired. I'm tired. That's right. Is, well, you know, tired, but doing well. Great. Uh, so we have a fun show tonight. We are doing our annual PCA recap show. Uh, we're continuing the trend that we did from last year where we brought in a panel of not just media, but ex exhibitors, brand owners, and retailers that attended the show um, so that we can get multiple points of view. So this is um, always fun. And I think one of our uh, probably most viewed videos and most downloaded audios uh, every year. So uh, excited to do this again. Uh, we'll start out with uh, introducing the retailers because they are uh, who... I guess run the organization so I'll start out with abe the badner from smoke in abe how are you doing tonight what's up thanks for starting from with me i was texting my wife we're good no worries we're... we got a good we got a good glow so it was perfect yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh next is jay davis from blue smoke of dallas and also a pca board member jay welcome thank you thanks for having me absolutely uh, off to the exhibitors and brand owner side. Uh, we'll start off with Pete Johnson from Tatuaje Cigars. How you doing, Pete? Good. How you doing? I thank should just for... answer like Jay. Like, yeah. Good. Thank you for having yeah. me. Uh, thank you for joining us last minute. I uh, appreciate that. I know I kind of caught you like a day and a half before. So I always like to make time for, you, for what you guys do. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next, Steve Sarka from Dunmartin Tobacco and Trust. Steve, welcome. Man, I'm fucking tired. <laughs> wait, 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 hold on. Hold on. <laughs> and brand owner side. All right. All right. Uh, media side. Uh, William Cooper, Cigar Coop. How you doing, Coop? Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And then John and I also on the media side, but we won't really count us. So uh, let's just hop into the topics. And I, I kind of want to go in maybe chronicle, chronological order from kind of how things go. And uh, one thing that Coop, John and I, and a lot of the media guys like to talk about is kind of what's going on in the industry leading up to the trade show, kind of the vibe of what's kind of happening leading up to it. And, uh, you know, sometimes we can maybe spot a trend or kind of what we think is going to kind of happen or what the, what the emotions or the kind of energy level will be heading into the trade show. And this year, uh, we had some good news heading in. We had some uh, FDA news that was kind of positive for the cigar industry. So I think that kind of set everybody off and thinking that we were going to be on a high note. So um, I'll, I'll leave this up to kind of the, uh, the brand owners and the retailers thoughts on kind of heading into the trade show, what you thought from the FDA news and kind of what you thought leading into the trade show, kind of what the kind of the, the vibe of things would, would look like. And anybody is, is free to kind of jump in if they want to start. Where you get these long, awkward moments. Yeah. yeah. I'll pick, I'll start picking people later, but I'll give you guys a chance to I'll jump start. In. Um, I thought that, look, as probably the person that would have been most in fact impacted by the FDA, if it had gone down the way it was supposed to go down of the four of us, um, I was obviously rather jubilant about it. Um, but honestly, uh, I think most retailers members are absolutely clueless and they don't really know what the hell is going on when it comes to the FDA. So I don't think it really impacted their point of view very much in any way whatsoever. Uh, the few keyed in guys, sure, but I think most of them were just happy that they probably had their very best year in the cigar business in 2021 dollar wise. And that was a reason why they were in a good mood. Literally, I, I don't think the bulk of the PCA membership, regardless of how much they try to educate and train them, are actually paying any sort of attention at all as to what's really going on when it comes to these things. That's my opinion. I, gr I agree with that. I, I think that there's a there's a small fraction of that, that room that probably really understood the impact that it had on the industry. And I, I also agree with the fact that people had a good high 2021 and we barely got to see each other last year. So this year was like, Hey, let's jump on board and, and have fun in Vegas. But no one really knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Hey Pete, is that me smoking in the background there? Who's that <laughs> dude in the corner? That's skinny Saka. That's, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Jay or Abe, what were your thoughts kind of leading into same, it? Same goatee. <laughs> you know, I, I was away. I was 
overseas when when this went down. So typically when stuff goes down like this, I'll reach out or people reach out to me and we'll talk about it. Um, but, you know, I, I'm probably one of the guys who is watching and wired in because what's good for the industry is good for me as a retailer. Um, so, you know, anything that will cease any kind of prohibiting of developmental stuff for this industry is good. So I was... I was happy to affect whether I went to the show or how I went to the show. Not really. I think our industry has just gotten to the point where we're just been existing regardless of what's been in the pipeline of what's going down. When every, when the deeming regulations first came out, we didn't make a micro blend for two years. Everybody was just like, well, what's going on and whatever. And then you just get to the point where, all right, we kind of went back to business as normal with everybody. So um, I don't think it impacted anything as far as us going to the PCA or the PCA show, but as a retailer, I was elated. I was elated for my manufacturer friends and for this industry as a whole, because, I mean, being able to function, create, develop, make stuff is key for what we do and what we, you know, our, our culture, our lifestyle. So for, for me, I was extremely, uh, you know, and, you know, I'm one of these guys, too, is, you know, everything always looks good. So I'm starting to call my friends. I mean, even Steve and I talked about it, I think, last Friday, you know. I mean, is this as good as it looks? I mean, is this really good? Because, you know, we've gotten so used to hearing good news over the years, it turned out to be not great news or maybe good news. But, you know, I mean, it was the overwhelming response from everybody. I was like, man, this is epic. So it was good to hear that after I got back in the country and started talking to some of my friends. How about you, Jay? Uh, the mood, I, I wouldn't say was positive, but it wasn't negative. Um, you know, even before I was on the PCA board, a lot of times, PCA shot itself in the foot or different things that happened. And it seemed like there was no negative energy. Um, I hate to say it, but I agree with the guys that I don't think most retailers care. I mean, when you actually got to the trade show floor, 95% of my conversations about the FDA uh, ruling were with manufacturers in the know and most retailers and some manufacturers, I don't think really have a clue or care. So it, it was just nice not to have you know, cigar con or COVID or, you know, any of those things over our head. It's, it's ironic that this is the first time in three years I haven't thought about COVID. And of course, I come back with COVID. Uh, but yeah, I, th I thought going in, it was a sort of a neutral vibe. And then when we got there, it was just, you could feel the energy on the floor from the, the first uh, time that everybody got together. And that was great. I hadn't felt that in, I don't know, six, seven, eight years. Hey, Will and John, what were your thoughts kind of leading into it from, from your side? Um, what I'll say is I kind of disagree with Jay a little because before the FDA announcement came, I thought there was a more positive vibe than what I've seen for a long time. Maybe going back to like 2014 or 15, that's how long ago it was. And at least I'm basing it on some of the North Carolina retailers and some of the other media people. And in fact, I was writing about that even before the FDA decision came down. So I thought it, I thought it was a really good vibe it, it was interesting though i the one night i went to bar luca i actually spoke to carlito and rocky and both of them were like a little upset that there wasn't more celebrating going on that night about the fda decision they both told me this separately so you know i so, think that was kind of interesting too that they were you know by whom what was that celebrating by whom Ce celebrating that uh, they beat the FDA and in particular Expected. they fe they feel that they were told they couldn't win this battle okay so who are they yeah we were all told we couldn't win that battle yeah yeah who are they expecting to celebrate that's what I'm asking because there was a whole big thing at the end of the trade show in Rocky's booth that had most of the manufacturers in there but... I, I'm just saying the night at Bar Luca which was the Thursday night beforehand I think they were just looking for a more proactive type of reaction to it I, I agree. I, I was there. You and I saw each other at the thing at Rocky's booth. Yeah. Yeah. Steve has, but, Steve has it best. I mean, the average retailer is really not, you know. And I think, Abe, that's exactly the case. Yeah. Retailer is not that into it or is yeah. out or is that emotional about it because they're just not seeing that deep. Yeah. So, uh, and I also think that what Pete said about even uh, there's so many of our manufacturing partners and brand. Well, that was, that was here, Jay that actually said also, that. And I was going to agree. I bet they they're really kind of disconnected too. It, it always blows me away how little so many people in our industry understood about the FDA and what the impacts were when this is literally their livelihood. So I, I can see where Carlito and Rocky would be upset because you figure you've had this hard fought battle for six years. I think somebody come and slap you on the back and say, great job guys. Right. 
I think, and I think that's why they got Carlito went the Rockies boost on like day two or something like that. And kind of those, hey, would you say, because I got there a little late, it was like a little pep rally they had, sort of to speak on that. Mm-hmm. It was a little pep rally. It was a beautiful thing if you could understand what you're saying. You know, yeah. the problem was with these little PCA expos is you have all the people who gathered at the Fuente Padron booth, you have all the people who gathered, and, and yet they, they didn't really figure, let's get a sound system where at least people can make sure they can hear, because I didn't hear shit. Steve, yeah, I couldn't hear shit either. We we know some guys, Abe. They'll probably work for cigars. I'm just saying, you know, there's a there's an ocean yeah, of expertise we, to pull from. I just wanted to say in defense of the PCA, the audio was terrible on a lot of things, but the Fuente Padron unveil, uh, that was that was Carlito and George Padron. We offered help, which it, we still would have had probably had bad audio, but that's on them. And I hope they never hear this part of the video. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna, we're, we're going to talk about that subject later, so. Whether it's don't, well, I, don't worry. Okay, I have to agree with with Coop in the sense that that leading in, it seemed like there was a positive vibe going into it. But I don't was. think I think it was more because people wanted to get together. Yeah, people yeah, just wanted I, to get I, back I, together, and the, and the FDA thing was like the cherry on top, right? Right. But still, there was a lot of people like Steve and everybody said there were a lot of people that didn't understand the impact of what that did for the industry. They still don't. They won't even understand whatever comes out of Meta's <laughs> mouth next. Hey, listen, we get, matter. Up, we get so beat up over the years of semi-good news. It's not really good news. And, 100%. And, like, I literally had to call up people and say, look, is this as good as it sounds? Is this yeah. like, just yeah. just to reconfirm that this is. Like, but that's it, like everything with the federal court system. There's very rarely a, a clear black and white answer. And I, I'll be stunned. I have a feeling, look, I, I think that Meta's probably just going to kick it back to the FDA to reconsider going all the way back to where we were between option one and option two. I think it's really unlikely, even with his strong language, that he's going to actually set aside the deeming rule. I hope I'm wrong. I'd love to be wrong about this. But just knowing the way these courts work, it won't be surprising that he kicks the can back. I don't think this problem's going away. I think it's just going to be kind of pushed further down the road. That's what I think will happen. Because you got to always remember when it comes to a federal court, a judge is always not thinking necessarily about the decision he's making at the moment. He's also thinking about the court above him and what he has to do to not get overruled, right? And that's always a prime concern for any federal judge is to not get overruled in an appeal because eventually that federal judge wants to be a higher bunch level federal judge. And oftentimes the people that make it to the next level are the ones that get the least overturned at the appellate level. So you always got to kind of put that in the back of your equation when you think about what a federal court judge is going to do. And I will, I will say, having been to the, uh, to the trade show in January, that the uh, general feel, the general vibe in Vegas was starkly improved. Uh, January just kind of felt, I can't think the word I used was weird. It just felt odd around Vegas. You know, everything was just kind of off. And from the moment I got off the plane, I was like, okay, Vegas is back. It felt like Vegas was back when we were standing in the, in the uh, sort of hallway waiting to get in on day one. Uh, you could feel the energy in the room. You know, everyone seemed excited to get in, which, you know, I can't honestly remember that particular energy, maybe going back to New Orleans, going back that far is, is the last time I remember that. So, um, you know, I, I would definitely say there's a lot of positive energy, but yeah, I don't think anything for, for the majority of people it had nothing to do with the, uh, with, with the FDA ruling, which is a shame because it, it was, or theoretically is potentially uh, un, an unbelievable coup we'll see what happens but uh it's certainly the first positive real real positive uh news to come out in six years so yeah i i was very impressed you know as an attorney i listened to the oral arguments and when scott pierce told me the news i I just said don't editorialize it send me the opinion yeah and and i (laughs) i was shocked at some of the language because you know made as everyone else doesn't want to be overturned I don't know if he's going to, if everything's going to be tossed out, I think eventually we'll all still be regulated in some way and they're still going to get a tax, but that was a, a pretty firm decision and it was a big victory. I went up to all the different CRA members and that I saw there that night and, you know, I thank them personally. And, and obviously I don't know what the numbers are, but I want to say Pete, what about 13 of the 17 million or maybe more was from CRA and, you know, it was up there. Everyone. But thank you. Thank you for, I know you paid, everybody who paid, paid a disproportionate amount uh, when you consider that, you know, 51% of the industry didn't contribute very much. So it, it was it was a great victory for everybody. And, but you're right. I, I don't think that most retailers were thinking about it. Uh, 
but it definitely contributed to the mood. But yeah, it was a very positive show. Uh, so what, what you're saying, Jay, is that CRA membership does matter. And if you're not a CRA member, you probably should, you know, join up or renew. I don't know. I'll tell you what, if I was ever sued, I want Carly to be on my side because I don't say that out loud. You know, his, I won't, I won't his, his success right against Mondavi yeah, and his success. Everybody, everybody should. Look, no organization, trade organization is perfect. They all have their problems. Okay. But the point is, if nobody does anything, the ball never gets moved forward. So even mm -hmm. if it gets moved sideways and backwards a little and something, there is definitely always a goal. And there's no doubt that the CRA and the PCA for its flaws, and even the Cigar Association of America, which there are times I'd like to put a bullet in their head because their interests <laughs> and our interests don't align, all three of those parties got us to this point. And it's a point yeah. that's really pretty unbelievable when you think about how hard it is to actually make momentum against a federal regulatory agency. And that our little industry was able to get to this point. Look at the poor pipe guys. Well, the pipe guys are in the wasteland. They're doomed where they're at, okay? And they have all the same claims that we have, okay? Every single thing that they have is the same as we have, but they didn't get anywhere. And why? Because they didn't have an organization that was driving it forward. So all the faults, all the flaws, all the warts, all the ugliness, all the stupidity, yes. But guess what? In the end, it definitely made progress. And I, I, just, I, have, I just have to, you have to accept that. You can, nothing's perfect, particularly when it comes to something like this. There's an I Al Pacino speech in sorry. There's an Al Pacino speech in there about uh, game of inches, and that's that's all. Yeah, I just don't <laughs> recognize Steve Stocker from a year ago when we did this broadcast. You become such an optimist, but you're right. It it's a huge <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you said that live on the air, Jay. <laughs> I, no, I mean it, 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 this was a, a great great show, and just like I got to sit down with Steve for 20 minutes and. We didn't talk about the FDA. We just talked about cigars and life. And it was just nice to have conversations that, for the most part, were absent about the government trying to destroy us. Uh, you know, Pete can remember this. Remember well, what? <laughs> consumer con year. Every Everybody I talked to, I spent the whole show talking about consumer con. How many yeah. shows back in 2016, 2017, all we talked about was FDA? I mean, there were, there were these topics that were all consuming and they just sucked the blood out of you. And really, I didn't have any of those nonsensical yeah. conversations this year. I had plenty of nonsensical ones, but not the ones about <laughs> those. Topics. I was back to the regular ones that we used to enjoy. And that part, that was a very re refreshing change for the trade show for me. You got a couple messages. I'm not, I just raised the volume. Am I sounding better? There you yeah. go. Yeah, you sound good. You sound, yeah. You were a little low, Abe. How about now? Any better or no? No, you're, it's you're perfect right. now. You're, you're perfect. Yeah, yeah, you're perfect. Yeah. I got to raise the mic. All right. Thanks. Yeah, mi minus 10 dB. You're perfect. Uh, one of the minor things that uh, you guys didn't have to deal with, but uh, us international international travelers had to deal with is uh, just before the trade show, the requirement for uh, uh, testing to, to leave the United States got, or uh, pardon me, to come into the United States got dropped, which was a welcome thing for international travelers because it certainly took uh, just one less headache away from having to travel down to the States. So, uh, you know, like I said, you guys didn't have to deal with it, but it was greatly appreciated from any international traveler. I can assure you. You dealt with it with TPA, right? You had I to did. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I went, I went the hard route. I just decided to get COVID and get my free pass for 120 days. Uh -huh. So then every time they'd ask me for a test, I'd just oh, say, right. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Free pass, free pass. So yeah, I, di I didn't want to go through that again. It seemed like too much work. All right. So keeping on with the, the order of things, uh, Friday, the seminar day. Uh, did anybody uh, here attend any of the seminars? No. I've Unfortunately, that. I did not. Okay. I'm I'm always, always, I know Coop here. attended the line outside of the seminar. I, I, yeah, because yeah. yeah, I, I, I wasn't waiting on that line uh, as, as much as I would have liked to have gotten in. Um, well, yeah, it was just too why long. Wouldn't, why wouldn't they let you in? I don't understand. No, they that. let us in. Well, they, here's the deal. They were going to let us in, but we weren't going to get cigars, which I'm, which I was fine with, right? But it was like, you know, that would have been like an hour and a half of my time waiting online or sitting in a really bad seat. And there was other things we had to do uh, going yeah. into the show. Yeah. So um, we knew that ahead of time. I'm, and I'm not mad. I think personally that is something that should have been for the retailers. Uh, that's not for media. But it would have been nice if we had a little more access to it. But I don't blame PCA on that one. That, that's like I said, this was more of a retailer event. We we've had similar types of things we've done. So it yeah, wasn't... I was surprised. 
because uh, the line was pretty long and I had some people that were like, oh, we can sneak in. I'm like, no, I'll just go in at the end. And I went at the end. I was surprised that I got a cigar. I didn't expect it. But yeah, the energy in that room was great. The audio, it was really hard to hear. Uh, but the energy uh, it was amazing. And the cigar was pretty doggone good, too. And Jay, you know, I was talking about this with a few other folks. Um, like I said, this is something the PCA should just build on every year and like have a have a different person kind of do some sort of a, a seminar. Because I think this is what the attendees want to see. I don't think they want to see some third party guy talk about point of sale systems coming out to Vegas. But something like this, they, they can definitely do it. It doesn't have to be exactly like this. I, I agree. This, uh, yeah, because well, I, I just think this is this is the experience thing that people are looking for. What yeah. was our- the three names I mentioned? Two of them are here. I mentioned the soccer, yeah. I mentioned Pete, and I mentioned Luciano. Somebody that can go up there and that will draw a crowd that knows a lot about tobacco, and it would be awesome. Well, so I'm, gonna many- work on, I'm gonna work here. on. I'm gonna work on Carlito for the meeting. <laughs> but uh, but Abe, I'm sorry, well, you say something. I, what was the seminar actually? I missed it. Wednesday, Friday. No, it wasn't. They, they put together a cigar, Abe, that. According to Carlito, uh, he had never used these 13 tobaccos before, and the cigar had two wrappers, two binders, and nine fillers. Um, How big was it, an 80? Yeah, what are we talking about? <laughs> How does that work? It, it, it was a Toro. That math was, doesn't add up for a Toro. It, it was, I mean, I don't know how they get eight tobaccos in a petite Lancer Opus, but I mean, this, a, lot of half, was a half leaf, half leaf, yeah, quarter leaf. A lot of third leaves. But you know, it was a good cigar. Um, you know, I. I sort of say tongue in cheek. There's no way in my mind that that was that they had never smoked that, but that's what they said. But it was a good cigar. Uh, so it, it, so it, what, they had the cigars made before they got there because they couldn't make them during the summer. Oh yeah, they they, they were made and, and aged and had bands. They were ready. those are those cigars were good and ready to go. This unique cigar they gave out to everybody. But what was the seminar? Uh, Carlito talking about how he'd never talked about blending and then picking on Jose and then Jose picking back on him. Um, they didn't really talk about any of the tobaccos. That's what I'm saying. Honestly, I mean, and you guys know, I, I love Carlito, but it would have been much more, it was great, but I think it would have been great to have someone like Luciano or Pete there or Saka where you could really talk about, well, we're using these tobaccos and we're doing this for that. And they didn't really pull the cur- curtain back, but still, you know, they just talked about how they loved cigars and they talked about the FDA win and it was Again, yeah, I think plenty of seminars the same conversation about, about inches. I think anything more entertaining and more engaging is always good for the PCA. Yeah. Like one yeah. of the things I like, one of the things I like about Pearl Savor, and part of it's because I won it one year, but I like that whole thing where each manufacturer submits a cigar blind and they have the Pearl Savor tasting panel, you know, pick out the best of the cigars. You know what I mean? I think it'd be kind of cool if they had some sort of like cigar cup every year where every manufacturer got to. Hey, you get to bring any blend you want. It gets, you know, we put bands on it so nobody knows what it is. It goes to the tasting panel that's been chosen of eight people. And I like it if they make the people, some of the people from the factories, you know what I mean? Where they're part, because that's the way it works at Pearl Sabor is every factory gets to nominate who their taster is, right? And they get to send their taster and they get to submit their thing. And anything that's interactive, anything that's engaging, anything that's interesting, I think it just all adds to the quality of the program to me. Absolutely. I think one year they were talking about doing a roast, which I thought would be funny, but then you realize that maybe some shit, that was Abe's <laughs> idea, I believe. Some shit would come up that would be wrong and yep. we'd get canceled all over. I'll get really ugly really quick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so there's some, there are some feelings in this industry, right? Sometimes we all know a little too much. About <laughs> yeah, that, would, that could get super ugly. Oh, okay at the media house, not okay in the seminar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can see Abe as Don Rickles. I, Abe should be the guy that does the the roast. Yeah, you'll I, come back and you'll lose a few accounts. You'll have more shelf space. <laughs> Say something. This idea is so old that I was going to make Sal Fontana the first guy we put up there. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Here goes. Yeah. You you know to Jay's point though, like I don't think it mattered too much that they didn't get into the technicalities of the blend, at least for this audience, right? They could have, right? But I think, again, it was an experience thing. People wanted to have that up close and personal with Carlito and Jose breaking each other's chops. Um, and, you know, like I said, there's a lot of ways you could go you could go with that for sure. So, like I said, I thought that was a great thing that the, the PCA did. And judging from – I saw people online 45 minutes to an hour 
to get into this thing. So that that was saying a lot that they definitely had people's attention with this. They're definitely doing things better than they've done in the past, but they still they still have this issue of communicating everything to their members. That's like rough. it's really frustrating. Like when you know they sent out this survey and I knew the survey was coming, but I actually mentioned it to them and I said, "Hey, put in the survey why you're telling these are the choices. They didn't even put anything. Where would you rather go? Explain to people why we can't go anywhere else. Explain to people that we have huge smoking laws that, that we can't bypass and we have convention halls that we can't fit into. Explain these reasons. That way they know, okay, we only have two choices, so let me pick one or the other. But no, they don't do that. They just never do it. It's really frustrating. Jay knows that. I, I'm always pissy no, about that one. I, I don't disagree with you. I will say this, and uh, I don't think I'm violating my NDA. Uh, that was <laughs> a minority suggestion that I made that see what the see what the members think. I mean, ultimately, we'll make the decision. And to the, the, the board's credit, although that was a minority position, they went ahead and did it. But I'm all for a lot more transparency. Uh, I say it all the time, and some of the other people say it. It doesn't hurt. Just be, I do that with my employees. I mean, sometimes employees are like, well, why is this this way? And you just tell them the, the truth. And they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And I wish the PCA would be more transparent, but I will say that they have improved in that category, but sure. they still need to improve in that. Yeah, the yeah. transparency during the uh, the media session was uh, very much appreciated. And, uh, you know, I didn't feel like we got any softball answers to any, any of the softball questions that were asked. Um, you know, certainly a lot of the conversation was around the future of the trade show and where it was going to be hosted. A lot of conversation. A lot of the conversation, but a lot um, of the conversation. I, I think that speaks to, you know, if if there's one thing I think coming out of the trade show, one of the biggest issues on people's mind is where is it going to be? What are the options? Can we move it? And this is the conversation that comes up, you know, before the show and after the show every single year. So I think, I think there is definitely value in having that conversation and, and continuing to educate people. Like you said, Hey, like it would be great to have it in Tampa, but they need to build a new convention center. Sorry. That's just, that's just how it is. The yeah. reality of the situation is I'll tell you this because I hate going to Vegas. I hate flying to Vegas. Mm -hmm. I don't care where you put it. It's never going to be as good as an event show in Vegas. That's just the reality of, that we live in today. There's very few cities we can go to, and those two cities. I mean, listen, I loved it was in, in Orlando not that long ago. Jeff managed to pull it off where it happened in Orlando. That was a two-hour drive for me. Mm -hmm. Was that a great show? Uh, you know, no, not particularly. It was great. No, for <laughs> Jeff. Good for it you. Was great for Jeff. Great for your register, yeah. but no, it wasn't a particularly yeah. good show. You know, but it, it, here's a good example, like of the pros and cons for New Orleans, because people, a lot of people may not remember New Orleans. or may not have been to New Orleans. You're going to have a very different vibe at that trade show off hours. It, it's just, it, it's just no way around that. Listen, and people want to be centralized for this show. Outside of shows, really, New Orleans has all the elements of Vegas. I love New Orleans. One yeah. of my it does. It does. They have a great convention center, too. It's just you're not going to be central. It is going to be the issue. Restaurants. You know, New Orleans is a viable option if that's on the table. Well, it is. Yeah, I, I liked the option of uh, April in New Orleans. That was the part. That was the part that appealed to me the most was the fact that yeah. it would be April. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the yeah, second and not people... not hot as balls uh, July. Yeah, right. <laughs> Look, New Orleans is still going to be swampy in April. It's going to be wet, okay, but it's not going to be July like we've done a few times in New Orleans because that's mm -hmm. just brutal. But I would I would much rather I the April thing for me is way better. So the only, my only issue, and this is what I had expressed to the few people that had asked me from the PCA, if we're going to go to NOLA, I personally would like to go to NOLA for three years. And the reason why I say that is completely selfish. It's just it costs so much to move all the stuff that you have to move that it's really quite expensive. I think, I mean, I think at this point I'm sitting somewhere like around 8,000 pounds of crap and mm -hmm. 8,000 pounds to move it is going to be like twenty two dollars to $25,000 to get it to wherever it's got to go. So I'd rather not move every year. So if you're going to pick some place, at least put me there for three years so I can store it locally and not have to pay that kind of VIG because that's that's a really tough VIG. If we start yep. moving every year, I'm going to have to dramatically rethink my the way my booth is designed and go with much more pop-up walls and 
no more comfy furniture and big table or any of that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No more comfy furniture. That might be a bridge too far, Steve. Oh, <laughs> this chair also will be comfy as fuck. Right, I'll have there'll be <laughs> one comfy chair, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And, I, and I'll buy it every year from one, one big ass leather chair and like se- seven yeah. folding chairs, right? Yeah, because it, <laughs> it, it costs so much to move that stuff around. So wherever we go, I hope we go there for at least three years. And I can't speak for other manufacturers, but I wouldn't be surprised that most that don't have a 10 by 10 would echo my opinion on that. I, I, yeah, I, I agree. Two or three at least. Yeah, I, I can't say for certain, but I, I think that that's the hope is that, and I think any place that's going to host us wants a multi-year deal. You tend to get a, a better deal if you do that. Right. They're going to want a three-year contract. You know they will. Um, All right, so we are making it to Friday night with the opening gala. Uh, I know some of us attended. Did, did everybody here attend at some point? My no, I missed it. Okay. So Abe, what would you think? It's not really a gala, is it? I don't know. I mean, look, first off, it's nice to see all the new companies who are picking up sponsorships because a lot of the major ones are no longer there, right? Um, and it, it was similar to last year. I think Eric Espinosa did it last year. But it's just a, a lot of standing around smoking and drinking. That's kind of right. what it is. Um, I, I remember opening galas that had people walking on stilts and shit 10 years ago and, you know, and fun stuff i mean i I, you know i don't know what the sponsorship level is i don't know how involved anybody gets but let's put it this way outside of the socializing being able to see some of my friends that i haven't seen in a long time for a little bit it got old fast you know i mean there's only there's never enough seating in this stuff right because it's just not and and so 90 percent of the people are having to stand up which is fine but then there's nothing to do standing up you're hoping one of the hors d'oeuvre people walk by and hand you something. Um, you're smoking, and if you're thirsty, you're going to wait in line and get a drink. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it'd be nice to see more of a entertaining or something. There wasn't even like a nice, unless I missed it, even just a nice area where you could have taken some social media photos or something or a step and repeat. Simple things that would just add it right. a little interactivity during things you know i mean and like i said i don't know if that's the sponsors thing if the pca just sells it and expects the sponsor to do anything or they give any input to them but i think part of the issue though is i mean the convention service costs are so high now i mean it's like literally i mean look you guys you go to that bar luca and a bad cocktail is 18 dollars for god's sake and so i mean i mean i just let me say this I bought, so I had like a little suite that I used this year to smoke after the show. I bought eight Red Bulls, six diet sodas, six regular sodas, 12 bottles of water, the glassware and ice. And that was uh, $378 to get it delivered to my room. Yeah. And there, therein lies the problem. The costs have gotten so out of control that it makes it really hard for you to do something special and nice anymore because the prices are just so nuts, man. They're just absurd. I mean, here's the bottom line. How, how many of us went to the gala? I'm sure all the media guys did and Jay did. Okay, so is that something you're going to look forward to next year? I oh, agree with you, Abe. I mean, honestly, one of the challenges is that um, getting companies that want to sponsor. I mean, we spent three hours one day in a meeting and then another time, an hour and a half, discussing whether or not we had enough for 1,500 people because the costs became exponential over 1500 so let me throw an idea out to you jay i i agree we need to let me, let me throw this idea why something that i would be interested in sponsoring because it would help my business would be instead of you having a gala if you just had a large convent a large space that we had every night where you brought in rental furniture from an outside company and you had cash bars okay where everybody could get together comfortably and there'd be some more seating, I think you would get a lot of people that would spend time in that space because everybody likes to hang around that circle bar, well, what we now call the circle bar that's square. But I mean, because we all want to be together, but there's just no good place. So I think just providing a place where everybody could be together. And if you said to a manufacturer, hey, I want you to rent 
two sofas and four club chairs from one of the off party companies, you might, you might be surprised at what sort of response you would get. And I think you could just pay for the space. And if you just had cash bars, cause look, everybody's willing to pay for their own drinks. We see it at the bar anyways, and the hotel will be happy to staff cash bars in that space. This is an idea that I did many years ago in 1996, where I just rented a large ballroom from the MGM Grand and I ended up bringing in sofas and I was doing a party for four days for cigar smokers called Boondoggle. And we just set it up with third party furniture. I can't remember the name of the company. It's a big company that rents that type of furniture. And it went over really well because it was just there all the time. You're talking about making a PCA bar after hours. Yeah, a PCA yeah. bar after hours. Transition from the opening gala to something else. I just want to make so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about every night from every night o'clock to midnight. You just have this and cash they, bars in there. They and tried just, it. it they kind of tried that last year, and I think it yeah, kind of flopped. Yeah, they tried right? it on the convention room floor. Mm. Yeah, they tried to no do one it wanted to walk all the way back. Yeah, nobody wants to walk all the way yeah, back all the, all that <clears> way. <throat> and also, it wasn't like it was that comfortable, anyways. You were just on the concrete floor. You, if you do it in a space where you can dim the lights and you put a little bit of potted plantery, you can really you can a little bit of shrubbery, you know. <laughs> you, you can you can actually make it look pretty decent. And, and I think, as Abe said, what you're really looking for is you're looking for a place where you can sit and interact with 8, 10, 12 people at a time. And then you can mingle to another group of 8, 10, 12 people, you know, and because uh, what happens at the bar in the Venetian is once you get a seat, you never leave that seat. You own that yeah. because if you give that up, I mean, that's like you got like squatter rights in a gold rush. Right? <laughs> now you that's pay yours. $50. Now you have to pay yeah. $50. So, so what happened at the, uh, the, the gala? It was like, I mean, I saw pictures of it and, and it looked like a, a really bad man cave because they had concrete floors that you had to stand on. But I mean, did they have entertainment or anything? They, no. had, they, they got up and did a speech a little bit. Timmy, I think that whole thing took less than five minutes, I think. But other than that, yeah, I mean, listen, one of the best ones that I've been to in years um, was the general cigar one uh, during the year of Cigar Con. But they also put in a ton of money to put that together. Yeah, that that Cohiba one. That was the Cohiba yeah. white white label. That was a good job. They they did have a band there, didn't they, this year at the at the uh, gala? Music. I don't yeah. think so. But I, I there, think was a sta- there was, there was a I stage. I remember hearing Background music. Maybe it was just background, but remember to the he, point. Was it, did he have a DJ or any background music or anything? I'm pretty sure they had music because I remember just trying to talk over it a couple of times. But I don't. I think you're right. I don't think it was a band. Now I'm just saying it, 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 it was. There was music, but it was. You know, the thing is, it had this industrial feel to it. I think that that was one thing that was clear. And here's what I'll say about. The gal- these gala events. If you had something else to do that night, you were going to leave that event and go somewhere else. And I know we, we did that. Uh, where I go back to the Cohiba thing, and I understand there was a lot more money behind that. That was an event you wanted to kind of stay at. So I think this, I think this opening gala was better than it was last year, for sure. But still has got a way to go. I know I don't know about Pete's team, but I know for us, that's the night we go out as a company before the trade show. Yeah, we did the same thing. We all have dinner together to kind of it's kind of a quasi sales meeting pep talk dinner, you know, unwind a little bit because you just spent the last two days setting up and sorting. So it's like, Mm -hmm. okay, this is the last moment we're all going to have a breath before we get shot out of a cannon. So let's just take a moment, catch our breath, have a couple bottles of wine and try to enjoy ourselves a little bit before hell begins. Gala seems to be more geared towards retailers than it does manufacturers anyway. Cause like you said, most of you guys are really too busy. And then like you get, you get a moment's breath. I I, I don't remember seeing a lot of different manufacturers at, at any opening gala. Yeah. It's hard because you just, like I said, and, and, and if you don't have time to take the breath, it means you're still scrambling because something didn't get delivered or, Hey, you got to run to Kinko's and get this printed. So it, it gets a little topsy turvy there that last day sometimes. Yeah, yeah I yeah. I agree. It's some nice. I mean, uh, Alan Riven mentioned in the text about um, the Dorsey. I mean, if you had that kind of feel, but it was on a much larger scale, that would be nice with furniture because the Dorsey was great. You could sit down. You you had a good conversation, even though the music got loud. The problem with the Dorsey is that most people were hanging at Bar Luca. 
So it would be good to have something centralized that's not industrial with nice finishes. And I think the PCA could do a better job. And also I think manufacturers, um, a lot of manufacturers don't want to um, sponsor because it's expensive. Um, by the way, Pete, thank you for the lanyards this year. They were, everybody loved them. Yes. <laughs> well, dude, I mean, think about that. Think about that. Yeah. We actually go in together and share that. So it actually, I got a 50% discount on that because I went in with my father. So let me made, say this. I love the lanyards easy. too, because this was the first year I didn't have to take two of them to tie around my big fat neck. They actually, <laughs> they actually were long enough for a change. There's no way they're like a choker necklace on me. <laughs> like, hey, oh, let's save that six inches, man. <laughs> I don't know if you guys knew it, but they they were sort of, they were willing to do gag badges for you. So as long as you don't change your status from a retailer or exhibitor or whatever, you could change your name to Soupy Sales, or whatever, and they were doing that for some people. I don't know <laughs> if that's official, but that was kind of a fun thing that they were doing. But yeah, the lanyards were great this year. Yeah, I definitely put in some odd titles bad, for people. Bad, bad but idea. I, they didn't show up on the badge. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's a bad idea because of security reasons. Actually, I wouldn't be doing that. I, I know it's fun and all, but you should be sales. With that. Of course, <laughs> of course, you wouldn't, Coop. <laughs> well i mean there was already some security we already heard of a couple of security issues with the badges just with the saying, recycling one of us thought you'd think that was a good idea for a minute well i mean there was a security issue with the badges being recycled this year someone grabbed the some people were grabbing badges out of that recycled every year they, that's the first year i remember seeing a recycle i mean have you seen it before what do you mean like taking it off the showroom floor to give it to somebody else no, no, there was a there was a a bin when you walked out. I understand that part's tougher to overcome, right? But there was a bin where you dropped your badge in, but you could easily someone could easily pull it out and get back in, uh, or so you know so anyone oh, could I take the badge. Joe? Oh yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure I understand this. Maybe talk I'm... to your buddy Kevin Shahan. Hold yeah, on. so they're out, out walking yeah, out. It happened to him. It actually happened to him. out of the hall. There was yeah. a little there was a little bin that said recycle your yeah. badges here and you just dropped uh -huh. your badges in. So someone could just walk up to that bin and just take a badge out yeah. and then go into the show. Yeah, yeah. But why would you drop your badge in the bin until the last day when you no longer needed it? Well, some, some people, people may have left after day two, day three. Yeah. So you yeah. come up and leave early. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. A lot of guys like to keep their badge for a keepsake. Yeah, I have a uh, yeah, I kept it. Uh, Ask Jay Davis. You like just to keep your badge? How many, how many uh, great oh. smoke badges I have laying around my house, yeah. hanging on right? different hangers? Like it's crazy. Just getting back to the cost of uh, having a having a hangout hall. Uh, if you ask the average person that was at Bar Luca what they were spending a night at Bar Luca, and you just translated that into sponsorship, I'm pretty sure that would be a saving deal yeah. overall by a very very wide margin. And eighteen dollar drinks, fifty dollar tables. I don't know what the average guy's bill was, but I'm guessing it was in the high three or maybe even four digits. So translate that into a very small sponsorship deal for the, uh, for the, for the hall idea. And I'm pretty sure that gets sponsored with, with money to spare. Really, if you make it a cash bar. Yeah. yeah. And if you make it a cash bar, I think it's something that would work. And I think you would find that most, I think you'd find most manufacturers be willing to check in to have the, you know, the Tatuaje section and the Dunbarton section and the crown. Yeah. Of course, of course. I mean, and the well, biggest issue, like you sorry, well, the biggest the biggest issue was Bar Luca can't possibly contain everybody. There's no, so those like you said, those who get a seat get a seat. Everyone else is stuck, you know, hang nobody, around the periphery like mind, sharks. Nobody minds standing up and milling around a bit, but you mind it for three straight hours, right? And you mind it being nut to butt and and, and four mind, nights in a row yelled at by the security people that you're a foot off the carpet, That's right? You're in the way and yada yeah. yada yada and. It's just, it, it's just, we need a space that allows everyone to be collectively together, even if it isn't perfect. Listen, I was sold at club. As soon as you say club chair, I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> Tell me where to send my money. My, my Canadian dollars, they're in. Dude, they'd sit, they'd sit, they'd sit in fucking lawn chairs. If you did all the <laughs> lawn chairs, if there were enough of them. Absolutely. There needs but to be the, some big boy lawn chairs for me, but okay. I can but bring the, but the badges were very much appreciated. I know it seems like a minor thing. We've been harping on it for more than a decade now. Uh, it was very well done. And it, you can tell it was very well done because no one said anything about the badges this year. I mean, the people who appreciated it were vocal, but I, I just want to have it out there that it was, it was a small thing, but it was also a big thing and it was yeah. very much appreciated. I agree. Yeah. You know, and it, it, you took, you took one complaint, a, a big complaint off the table right away. 
So that was that was like and, you know, and I think people appreciated that. Well, last year the the paper badges that kept on ripping. Yep. Right, they didn't. They yeah. couldn't yeah. last for a whole day. They were terrible. Yeah. All right, so let's get into the show itself. Uh, finally, making it to Saturday. So uh, I'm going to start off with the exhibitors. So Steve and Pete, uh, booth size for you guys this year compared to last year. Steve, I think you were same size as last year. Yeah, I was identical. I'm. A, I was in a twenty by forty. Yeah, okay. same size here too. Okay, you, but Pete, you did have a bit of a different layout than last year, right? I just pulled some furniture from my my main booth that I'm not going to pull anymore, but I wanted right. pieces of it. I mean, the okay. desk helped, the bar helped, and the two the two display cabinets really helped. Right. Okay. I haven't gotten my bill for that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it helped. Uh, I did get my drayage bill. Yes, that came really quick. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I got I yeah. got that before I left the show floor, man. They had already banged my card <laughs> that day. I remember one night at Bar Luca. Eight thousand drayage is what it was for me. The I worst part is, is that they, they come over to your booth and they leave this pink notice that says you're past due. And you're like, dude, it, like all you have to do is come and talk to someone. And we'll give you a credit card, but don't tell me I'm past due. <laughs> yeah. That's the, always the embarrassment. You need to pay this now. Yep. I want to uh, know, ahead, sir, John. I want to know what the exhibitors and retailer in attendance retailers, pardon me, Jay. Uh, thought about the uh, the hours because obviously we have a lot of thoughts on the hours, but I want to know how it worked from your guys' perspective because you guys don't I, get the. I like the later start hour. I like it being one hour later because you got to remember, us that are running the booths, we have to be there an hour earlier than the show yeah, just, opens, right? So so we're already at an hour deficit. So when it starts at nine, it means I have to have my people in the booth like it on the first day, like at seven forty five, okay. And, but every day an hour before. And the retailers don't get out of bed anyways. So I'd much rather have it be 10 to 6. Right. My biggest issue is more the days than the hours. The only thing that happened for me is I just started drinking early. Yeah. <laughs> because at, at, at 4 o'clock, I'm like, okay, we, we got to be here for another two hours. Let's yeah. have a drink or something. Yeah. Well, that's the way it works. In my but I, I, I really appreciated not having to be up so early, especially having a lot of late nights. Yeah, it was one that, person complained to me, and that was Dan. Uh, he said it affected the ability to get dinner. What was that? Oh, I said Dan, your your partner was the only one that really had an issue with it, and I I brought it up to the board. He said that he felt that the hours went a little too late. If like they wanted to go to dinner, and by the time you get back, it's it's already late. But most people seem very happy with the new hours. I made my <laughs> reservations like three months ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's a Dan problem. I don't think. No, that. yeah, we we had that we you know because we didn't we didn't pay attention to the hours early on. We did realize that we had to push a few dinners back, right. and uh, it was no big deal. But uh, I was like, oh shit, we got to get to dinner by seven. Here, here's what I find: most people have dinner reservations like seven to eight o'clock, right? So even when the show would close at five, we would still have people hanging in our booth until about 6.15 anyways, okay? Because they knew how long they needed to go get changed and dressed for dinner. So by closing the show an hour later, it just meant that once the show closed, we were pretty cleared out of there within 15, 20 minutes, the closing bell. So we actually ended up going to about the same time every day in the booth with the hours being longer. Because if they have that extra hour between dinner, they just yeah. hang in the booth and they shoot the shit with you. Did you ever have any instance? So I had an instance where a security guard came up like right at like 601 and said, uh, you need to get off the floor. We had, it like, on one, we had it one day and we told him we were packing up and we left about 25, 30 minutes later. So, I mean, it's not like they were going to burn us at the stake. What were they going to do? <laughs> yeah. Do you have any thoughts on the hours, Abe? Okay, so what, what, what were the hours this year? Was it 11 to 6? 10 to, uh, 10 to 6. Okay, because there's one night, one day it was 11. Oh, sorry. No, it was uh, 10, 10, to, 10 to 11 was VIPs. Yeah. People that, uh, I, how do you get a VIP, by the way? I have no idea. It just showed up. You, you had to book Maybe. rooms in the hotel, like a block of rooms in the hotel or, or whatever, something like that. Uh, yeah, and it used to be back in the day where you donate to the pack. Pack, yeah. That is and yeah. you get in early. Okay, so VIPs got in from 10 to 11. Everybody else got in at 11. Right. Right. Okay. You know, so that, that, that shows me that there's a lot of people that didn't stay at the host hotels because there was between 10 and 11, you saw your core people 
but there was a lot of people that didn't show up until 11. Hey, no, we actually hit our, our room. It was a better way of, I think it was a better way of giving out the VIP badges because giving the pack is hard to motivate people to do. It's easier to motivate them to stay in the hotel and spend yeah. an extra $35 a night to stay at the host hotel than it is to get them to cough up 400, 500 for the pack. So I, I thought it was a pretty ingenious way to dole out the VIPs. to the What's room. is I got it. Yeah. I got a VIP badge. I had no reason why I got it. I'm like, oh, okay. Because when they check you in, like, oh, go get your VIP. I'm like, okay. I didn't even know what it meant. Rose, because you stayed at the Palazzo or the Venetian. Uh, I didn't know what it meant. Look, I think the new hours are great. I think, look, without a doubt, you could tell there was some effort put in between last year and this year. I mean, when, when you take into the consideration that they kind of had two years to plan last year's event or however long it was, and then in this year, huge even from the little things like the maps in the middle of, of the aisles the floor stamps in the rug um you know there was no squatting booths you know that looked like people were just squatting there it was a much more nicer looking show Seems i'll tell like you another thing that was ingenious Abe, that they did and this has affected us as exhibitors we always choose the tuxedo gray carpet because it's the most attractive of the carpet choices and this year the trade show chose that to be the carpet color for the aisles so mm -hmm. it was included in your booth price. So you ended up not having to pay extra because you have to pay for carpeting as part of your booth. Oh. And then if you don't like the red carpet that they normally give us, and the only person that likes the red carpet is Christian at, a, at CLE, okay, <laughs> you ended up having to pay for an extra bed of carpet. But we actually got a refund on our carpet order this year because it turned out to be the carpet color of the show. And I know that doesn't sound like a big deal, but you know what? 20 by 40 booth. It was like forty eight hundred dollars, I think, roughly, that I didn't have to spend yeah. on carpeting this year. That's two meals. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, no, it, it it looked much cleaner. It, it you know, could there you know look? I, I'm 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 an impact entertainment kind of guy. Could there have been things maybe every day planned where it was interactive on the floor? Maybe yeah, maybe no, whatever. But for me, just seeing the show, and I think Coop and I talked about this on KMA Saturday. You know, uh, he said he gave it a solid B, and I, I, I'm kind of in agreement. I think that show this year was a solid B. I think it was a huge improvement from last year. Um, and, you know, if they keep working towards it, you know, maybe hopefully eventually it'll become a more lively and entertaining place to go other than just to do business. Well, Abe, you, you said interactive, and, and Jay mentioned it with the whole point. I think I, the amount of people that went over to the Fuente Padron booth to see that presentation – it would have been, it would have been better if the and I know the PCA went to them and, and asked them, hey, let's let's do this. I think it would have been better if they just kind of said, no, we're going to set it up for you. And that way, everybody like shut off everybody else's music. There, I mean, there was blaring music like two booths down, so you couldn't hear anything, and like have it go over the loudspeaker, so like everybody could feel like they're involved with it. I think there was a missed opportunity there. Yeah, it definitely was. Yeah, but Pete, you could also see the counterpoint to that. I mean, how does that make the other exhibitors feel that Fuente Padron are getting this big feature thing? You know. Yeah. I mean? So I, I think I, any any good news for the industry is great news for the industry. Yeah, yeah, I ultimately don't care either because they didn't sell any of it anyways. There's no price yeah. on it anyways. There's no delivery date on it anyways. There's no ordering yeah. mechanism. There's no ordering yeah. of it anyways. So <laughs> it's not like it affected anybody's orders. You but, heard it here first, 2024. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> That's the next reveal, right? Yeah. So, so <laughs> actually, so, make yeah. twenty-four. So, uh, so, so, John, we're in the minority. We're not going to win this battle on the hours. No, no, we're not going to win the. We battle. hate the hours. Oh, you, we you we hate them. the hours. Why? We, if, so there's there's two obviously for me uh, reasons. yeah it's very selfish so it's there's two selfish. issues that we're faced with one is um, we never have enough time despite the fact that you know everyone says everyone clears out. Um, there's never enough time for us. Uh, we're always kind of trying to strike that balance between, you know, getting into a booth and getting, uh, the information we need without trying to step on the toes of retailers, which, uh, ironically, this is the first year I would say that, uh, I would almost say that manufacturers exhibitors were actually too accommodating. And we, we had several, uh, points where we actually had to take a step back and say, like, I can see retailers that are standing there waiting to talk to you. We're going to withdraw from this conversation and let you handle that. And we'll come back, um, which was kind of surprising. Um, but, you know, like we, you know, I think for us, ideally, 
we we would be on the floor now like if you said uh steve you're saying guys on the floor at nine o'clock we'd be on the floor at nine o'clock if we could just to that one hour a day for us for media would be instrumental in us being able to get all the booth photos and all the say, uh, floor photos. Year, so can I ask, do you guys get to get on the floor early or do you have to at wait 10. till 11? We no, got we get in with the at 10. VIPs. Oh, so you, you got in VIP. So yeah. mm-hmm. which, which was a big help to us because there's certain booths that are very like congested that we were able to get to. Um, huge help. Huge help, yeah. I, mean, I think I was going to yeah, say, I mean, if like you guys our booths- earlier, I think if you said to me, hey, I want to meet you. At, look, we're already there an hour before the show opens anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, if you said to Pete, hey, I want to roll by this day, you know, 30 minutes before the show opens, he'd probably, he'd probably welcome yeah. it. Security won't yeah. let us. That's the problem. Yeah, they, 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 I think they need but to change You need that to pick because... those badges up out of the recycle bin. Like, like, <laughs> like, like if it was one minute before, like 10 o'clock, no, you got to wait the one minute. They actually have told us that. They make you wait I, that one minute. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, listen, man, you guys yeah. need a lot of time. Like you said, you need a lot of time to go by the yeah. booths and take pictures. We don't tear shit down at the end of the night. We leave it set up so it's on display. So if you guys have access, even before we get there, at least you have access to take pictures and and video. And then you get the the other stuff later on, the interviews later on. But what happened, there's little things that probably aren't of interest to retailers or exhibitors that media has to do. Like we had like backups, right? So like we have to start our backups, right? And, And then there's dinners. And a lot of times this year, because of the compressed time, we couldn't go back and get the backups set up somewhere. But so you are we right about this, like, dude, We don't really give a fuck about your No, you don't. It's purely selfish. Reason. We were very yeah. clear on that. We, yeah. we have our own shit to deal yeah. with. Yeah. <laughs> we, we play Coop the Violin. Hang on. <laughs> uh, oh, but, 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 oh, let me tell you, if someone's boost video doesn't go up, boy, do we hear about it, right? And if the backup, if the, if the original gets lost, you know, boy, do we hear about it. I don't know. Yeah, but- me but when coops on the other side of the, an argument that i'm in or an opinion why do i feel better about my side <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I, I think the other thing we were challenged with so the reason i was part of the reason i was asking about the hours is um you know obviously as media we have we have uh, social obligations um because you know there is uh an, an element of if you get an invitation and you don't show up you guys are kind of dicks for not showing up so um, which sound, makes us sound more popular than we are. But when you have two or three things in an evening and you haven't eaten in 12 hours, and I know I'm, I'm not a fat guy anymore, but I still hunger and eat like a fat guy. So, you know, when I have gone 14 hours without eating and someone says, well, dinner's at eight o'clock, Loomis has to deal with, you know, the hangry face for like the, the three hours between the show close and the, and the dinner. So play the um, violin, Abe. Play you, the violin. You're on, you're on mute again, Abe. <laughs> We're missing the good stuff. Sorry, I had to order another drink. But seriously, John, all due respect, and let me just... Are you ordering drinks? Man, I, I don't have anybody around. I don't I'm going to step on camera so I can a get bar. a drink. <laughs> Man? No, listen, with all due respect, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm just trying to be a guy who spends a lot of his t- life doing time management, right? If the show times, if they give you the same amount of time to do your job, please explain to me what difference it makes if it's an hour this way or an hour this way. Isn't that just come down to time management and how you're handling your time or am I just insane? So the, the, so the big thing for the hour in the morning, that would actually be the biggest impact for us. If we had an extra, even a half an hour in the morning, um, it allows us to get in and not interrupt and get in the way of, of sales reps and retailers. You currently have. Say again. Sorry. Thank you, Anna. You're talking about having an additional hour than the time you currently have. Is yes. That what- yeah, yeah, that would that would, that would that would be a that would be a game changer for think for most media. Why don't you, why don't you guys petition for manufacturer access then? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. We've been told. Uh, well, we oh, could, but we've been told that's an insurance issue. You've aged some time. Yeah. yeah. Um, insurance issue. Why we're all there tripping over the same shit as everyone else? I don't know why. Never. I didn't even check in. I never got my badge. I got in every every day under a manufacturer badge. Yeah. Sorry, Jay. Um, John. So you're, <laughs> Your real issue is not when the hours are. You Correct. Take more time. Yeah, I mean, like I said, if if we could have just a, an hour. Sorry, I keep talking over you, but I apologize. I'm just saying that makes sense to me because the original question, Aaron, was how did you like the new hours? Right. And Coop don't like it, but it's not a matter of when the hours. 
you would just like more time than the other. Right. Hour if we had more time, we could fix some of these problems. I mean, it doesn't solve my problem with the backups, but that's okay. There's there's other ways we can get around. It. <laughs> and, and I would John, say this. John's point, yeah, John's yeah. point's right on. And I wouldn't say I wouldn't say this is a complaint about the hours specifically. This is just you know one of those like this is an incremental improvement that I think would improve the lives, make life easier for media. And then obviously, you know, I think what we were challenged with is that a number of people didn't really think about the later hours in terms of planning dinner. So, you know, now that we're sort of cognizant of that next year, when someone says, Hey, do you want to meet for dinner at eight o'clock? It'll be, how about seven? How about, yeah. how about six forty? How about six fifteen? We just walk off the floor and go straight to, uh, to, uh, you know, wherever there's food. Well, I'll tell you what this guy, so we can move on. Um, I am more than happy to present to the trade show committee that I think personally, you guys should get an hour early before the floor opens. And I also think you should be able to get in all day Friday um, mm. I can propose that. And if you, Aaron, if you, you, you guys want to put together some of the other things, like I know that you want to place to store your stuff and plug things in. I think those are reasonable question, reasonable requests. I can bring them to the PCA and they can think of an unreasonable way to uh, I tell you no. to say yes. <laughs> so disliked already, Jay, it's not even funny. Yeah. But, but what? You know, Aaron, I'm, I'm texting Scott Pierce right now. About this. <laughs> well, let me say, oh, don't text Scott. We'll, we'll <laughs> talk to Lisa and Aaron about it so that Scott doesn't have to do everybody's job. Yeah. I, I think it's a reasonable request. I mean, I'll bring it up. And look, they've made big progress with us too, with the media. I mean, the fact we've always had this hour access for many years, but it wasn't until Scott got there where they actually told the security people to let us in early because every year we would get blocked. Right from getting in, even though we were told we had access and we had to call someone from the PCA to come down and tell security. It was such a point that we would make a joke every year, like how fast it would happen. I mean, every, we would bet every year that it would happen. So they fixed, they fixed a lot of things. And now they, they make sure it's part of their operation that, Hey, media gets in the hour. Well, if it was a betting thing, Coop, based on your sports predictions, I would say you lost every year. Oh, <laughs> okay, right? that's the one I won, Pete. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I bet Loomis won. I think Loomis and I went one year and, and I won it. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's the one I could say I'm right on. <laughs> but now it's been a lot. The last, the last two shows, it's been. Some of the hours. Are we going to talk about the days, though? Because the days are actually more relevant. Well, me. yeah, we'll get to that when we talk about. Uh, the, I will tell you real forward, quick, though, forward. about Friday. You mentioned Friday. Friday's a little tough sometimes because we are still setting up. Yeah. And then we also are having meetings. Yeah, and that we try yeah. to keep some things on the DL, <laughs> right. and to have media walking by. I mean, there's, there's no. I secrets can understand it. I can everybody understand knows. Yeah. Everybody knows, but it, it, you know, sometimes the way we talk to our sales team is not always the nicest. So <laughs> that's just from me, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm nothing but peaches and roses. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so for Steve and Pete again, uh, in regards to uh, retailers that were attending and visiting your booths, um, did you feel that you had kind of more, uh, any uh, new retailers that you were doing business with that you had done previously? Or was that number had, up or a, below? I had a lot of new retailers this year, but part of it was because we had publicly said that we were going to open 25 accounts at the trade show. Right. So we had a tremendous amount of new retailer traffic. Now, I can't, I can tell you, we didn't write, but maybe half of that new retailer traffic because they were unwilling to do the minimums that we require for them to do. So we turned away a lot of new retailers, but they came in, they heard the spiel, they expressed an interest. You know, maybe another year from now, they'll go, you know what? It's worth gambling that much on Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. So the number yeah. of new retailers for us is still very high, where I imagine for Pete, it's much lower because he's been around so many more years and has so many more accounts. Because I remember when I was at Drew, we had all the retailers, right? There was so rare there was a new retailer to even be written at all. Yeah, we still got a few new retailers. I mean, they were there uh, for sure, but it wasn't uh, I've done, the the worst part for me. And Abe, you can play the violin. I decided to to forget to put in the new products into our system, and we were remoting in from the trade show to Los Angeles to our server and printing invoices for our crew in Los Angeles to pack as we were getting orders for the first hour of the show i was still inputting the new products so that didn't work out too well yeah but that's a you problem that's what i mean that's why i want the violin <laughs> there you go that's a big violin coop <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, <laughs> oh my god it is a it is a baby violin I it, is. Really it really is yeah. 
violin than my, my big hands. Viola. It's a viola. Isn't that the big violin? You're going to buy one of those off Amazon. <laughs> Even comes in a nice handy case. <laughs> you know, maybe we could uh, give uh, one of those violins to everyone in the media as part of a media kit next year. That'd wow. be great. There you go. Oh. All right. Who wants to sponsor that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll sponsor that. Able one. to yeah, care. That was already good. Uh, let me tell you, they, if Pete sponsors it. I think it should happen because I think that was one area that the PCA really needs to improve on is some of the sponsorships. Stuff, shit, so. shit, man! I made tissues for the SNS yeah. Club one year because everybody was crying <laughs> about the way we released stuff. Hey, Jay, you just completed your first year in the, on board on the board, and I didn't resign. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Putting people on 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 that video. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for Abe and Jay, uh, your thoughts on the trade show in regards to uh, the exhibitors and the companies that you were making purchases from, new companies, whatever it may be. Did you go in? Did you have a plan? Did you stick to the plan? Did you What adjustments did you make? You want to go, Jay? Sure. Um, I always have a plan, but I never stick to it. I always spend more money than I plan, but it usually works out well. Uh there were a couple of people I met with in the Sutliff booth, and it was very hard to move around there because that booth was packed. Um, I don't know. I was I don't remember the whole question that you just asked because I'm old, but uh, <laughs> I, I thought that You're I, I, drinking. <laughs> it, I've had COVID for four days. I finally got a negative test today, and my brain's still kind of messed Pete, up. Pete, I'm a little disappointed. I don't even see wine in front of you. No, I'm I'm drinking um, a bourbon. Oh, okay. Cheers to you, too. Yeah. Jay, uh, the question was, uh, you know, going in, you had a plan, did you, you know, what made you adjust your plan? And, and what did you think about uh, maybe new exhibitors, new brands that uh, you hadn't seen before? Yeah, well, I mean, like one company that I was carrying, but I, I deepened a lot with was Aventura. I don't know. It's, they, By the way, Aventura, in my opinion, had the best gift for anyone who bought at the booth is you had this incredible chocolate that uh, bought a lot of love and grace for my wife. Um, Fuck! The, I didn't eat chocolate. I'm it was amazing chocolate. It was like brick, like little bricks. Yeah. What the fuck? Uh, they they had an they had what they called an elite program, where if you were spending a certain amount each year, you got access to certain cigars. And and I'm sort of been drinking. And the you got chocolate. Oh, and I got the chocolate. Um, I'm going fudge next year. <laughs> oh yeah, fudge is the way to go. Uh, so that was positive. Then they're also you know like you know I, I'm a total fanboy for Pete. I mean Pete had you know, all kinds of stuff. And it's like, you know, he kept telling me I couldn't order more than such and such. So finally, I just like, give me, give me, give me. And I think a lot of it is we don't, I don't really know if the sales are going to continue to grow. I mean, they're still growing, but not the same percentages as last year. So for, for what I'd call pillar brands like Tatawahe, I know that they're selling well and I need to carry more. And, you know, that was good. But then there were also some new booths that had some exciting cigars that I was excited about the blends. I smoked them. I liked them. And, uh, but we didn't really add a lot of new, new brands per se, but we went deeper with the companies we've been doing well with. And so from that perspective, it wasn't a, a big trade show in the sense, I think we only added two new brands, but we went deeper with a lot of brands, brands we were doing well with. We went deeper with them. And, you know, like Crown Heads was one of those. They had like six new releases and trying to figure out what to get. But the problem was I liked all the releases. So just trying to figure out what you're, you're going to carry was a challenge. But these, those are good problems to have that the, a lot of the cigars were good. And a lot of the companies, they're doing well with us. And we wanted to deepen the relationship. Hey, how about you, Abe? Uh, fuck. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what, what Did you go in with the plan? Did you stick to the plan? What made you move off the plan? So what I, you know? Look, I don't want to sound bad, but he doesn't buy cigars. Yeah, I, got him at the point where I don't need a plan anymore. Right. <laughs> I have an operations guy. He makes the fucking plan. I, I listen. I was away for the forty five days right before the trade show. Yep. Two days of being back home before I had to get on a plane and leave for the trade show. Um, when I go, I have a different plan, right? So I'm I'm working on micro blend projects, great smoke stuff other things that aren't really pertaining to the day-to-day -day business of, of running our company. Um, I have a great team an operations guy that goes there and he handles all the appointments. Um, so that question doesn't really relate to me well, cause I'm kind of on my own little, what I have I to ask the question in a different way, Abe. Yeah. Um, so there was a myriad of new companies this year at the trade show. 
And there were a lot of brands that were just really new to the marketplace. May have been around in the last year or two, but this was probably their first time to exhibit. Did you did you purview all of that? Was there anything in that whole mix of I don't want to start naming companies because that isn't fair. I'll tell you right now. I mean, I was there? I mean, did 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 you make it a point to go through all of those new ten by tens that were towards the back of the show? I um, I try not to, to be honest with you, because the way I operate is look we we're pretty good at being in tune and trying to listen to our customers. So if there is a brand that we feel that has some traction or we see, or our customers have asked us for, then I make it a point to go see them. Right. Um, for me to just out of the blue, bring in somebody's brand that no one's asked for. None of my managers or, or my team has bought up that any of our customers asked for. We never got an email asking if, to bring this brand in. No, there's no point for me to go and seeing them because look, Steve, just like your warehouse space or your warehouse space, we only have a limited amount of space. So we have to optimize the space that's being used. So unless I know there's some kind of possible calling or need or desire for it, I, I don't want to walk into a guy's booth because then that, you know, he thinks that, oh, wow, I'm going to get a smoke in order and there's really no need. So we really kind of walk around with our heads down, not try to make eye contact with a lot of those people. But I, I was going to it. I knew two off the top of my head. So we bought in, and I was just going to see if I remember anymore, but we bought in, we, we opened accounts with two companies that we never dealt before, with before this year at the trade show. And I, I'm just scrolling through my orders to see if there was any more, but yeah, we bought in two. Well, I want to give them a shout out in case there's some other retailers listening so they can try to say, take the wisdom of Abe and maybe run with it. Um, I don't know if it's the wisdom of Abe. I mean, really, I mean, um, we bought in Septimo which okay. has mixed feelings from everybody. Um, yeah. But, you know, there's multiple factors involved with us. We've had a few people ask us for it. And also as an online retailer, when there's not a lot of people that are out there selling the brand on a national level, it becomes a little bit more attractive for us because I'm not competing with 300 guys who are selling it online. So it's easier for us as a company to find the niche. And we bought in a brand that we've actually had requests for a long time or people who have kind of, asked us about the brand and um they've always had this weird setup of how to get the brand and i'm like you know this is not 1997 i'm not going through you know hoops and and, and fire rings of fire to get your brand in um was at a bay um because before you had to you had to get like a lot of the other stuff before you'd be considered so they made like this opening package of at a bay byron and bandolero uh, to bring into your company. So we bought the, that package and um, that didn't make us have to go through all the hoops of- uh, Yeah, but I mean, I think Atabay, Byron, they've been probably exhibiting at the trade show for at least the last six years, right? Oh, yeah. no, way longer. I remember the first- Yeah, it's been a long time. Long? About 10 years. About, yeah, they only skipped one about show, which was last year. But yeah, they've been- I, I think that's what a lot of small companies don't realize is how long it actually takes to get a retailer to finally come and pay attention to you. Well, yeah. I I mean, it's not that I didn't pay attention to them. No, but you know what I mean, to come and actually take you a know, hard look and make a decision. Because, look, you don't walk into any retail store that has empty shelf space. Listen, you want to laugh. So, you want to laugh. I remember it wasn't for South Fontana, but I remember going to the trade show in 97, 96, or something like that, um, where Ashton was telling people that they had to order their accessory line and eventually they'll be considered to be opened up for a cigar account. Right. I mean, some absurd shit. Right. But they got away with that shit back then. And Atabay is one of these companies that kind of had that like little loophole. I've been doing this for 26 years. I'm not buying eight different brands that I don't want, or I may not sell to get this line. So for people who attended the PCA this year, they made a nice little opening package of, you know, the Atabay and Byron lines and whatever. So we, that was one of the other two. And there might be one more in there. I was trying to scroll through my my orders quick, but that was two off the top of my head. I know we brought in that we didn't carry before. Right. There was actually one other company that we were looking at. And, um, you know, I, I, I like to have time. I sat down. I, I sat down. I had a nice long conversation with the owner, uh, the owner of Septimo, Zaya. And um, I, I, sit and, I met with the owner of, uh, I forgot his name, but what an interesting gentleman. Uh, the guy from Atabay and Byron. Nelson Alfonso. Nelson. Nelson. So, yes. Yeah, he, yeah. And, you know, hard to understand a little bit, but great, great conversationalist. And 
I like to know the people. And one of the other companies that I think we were looking at and we just didn't get a chance to sit in with them and, and have a, a discussion was um, Black Label. Mm -hmm. Don't know a lot about them. I know there's been a few requests from my company. I was hoping to sit down with them and get to know them a little better because I really like to know the people I'm doing business with, you know, and um, we just didn't get a chance. But that was probably one other company that we might bring in later. If, you know, you're on their third factory, Abe. <laughs> so, Abe, Abe, did you uh, buy the five point five million dollar lighter? <laughs> you bought two. Good, good. On consignment. <laughs> OK, that's good. <laughs> I have a I have a question for uh, Pete and no. Steve. Um, we had some interesting feedback from one of the exhibitors, which I thought was interesting. And they said, uh, and again, just talking about incremental improvement is, you know, you have some of the larger retailers who might have four or five people from 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 their company represented. And they said, what would be what would be helpful is to have their the badge of the main purchaser if they could sort of self identify either like a gold. I don't know, like like a green dot on it or a gold thing to sort of identify who the main purchaser was. Would that be helpful? It would be helpful to have to have an indicator who the primary buyer would be helpful. But I think Pete will echo my sentiment on this. When you get to Pete's size, he already knows who the main buyers are, right? Yeah, so but we, same same with Duke. Steve. You've been in the business forever, right. so, so we kind of know. We faces. already know that, but yeah, would it be helpful for my people? Like Attica helps us at the trade show every year, right? So she's at TPE and she's at the PCA and that's the only time Attica's around. So yeah, would it help Attica for there to be a green dot? It would help for her to know who she's really talking to. That, that oh, I like that idea. Helpful. So, I mean, so yeah, of course, Dave Lafferty and me and Cindy, we know Pete and his team know, Dan know, and all those guys know, but yeah, for, for the other people, yeah, I think some sort of indicator as to who the primary buyer is would be helpful. And it doesn't even have to be, look, I would leave it up to the retailers because some retailers have three primary buyers, right? So if they need three that are green special, then let them have three green special dot ones. You know, they don't need to limit it to one, but it would be helpful to have that. And that'd be easy to do because when you sign up for badges as a retailer, you have to identify who is buying privileges. So that should not be hard to do. Well, there you go. There you go. You're going to go into the next board meeting with a bunch of ideas, Jay. Yep. Because it's a COVID about. fog, so you won't remember any of it. <laughs> right. I'll send him a list. You can watch the video again. You can watch All he's going to remember is that A bought two lighters. That's the only <laughs> thing he's going to watch. Can you believe that A? He bought $11 million with the lighters, man. <laughs> I'm still in shock that I bought an $80,000 LE blue humidor. I don't know how I'm going to sell that. <laughs> oh, you're, you're one of the people that bought the Opus X one? Wow. Yeah. Jeez. Good for you. Man, right. he can give me a hug, and I'm like, yeah, "Hey, let's be honest. Heart. It was seventy nine thousand dollars. It wasn't eighty. Well, <laughs> what irked me is they sold it last year for seventy thousand. So I got it late. Hold, hold on. I, I just need to really ask this, Jay. You bought an eighty thousand dollar retail humidor. Yes. You got fucking balls like this. <laughs> well, I sold greens like this. I sold seven of the ten thousand. Marie's got big hands, so those are big balls. <laughs> That's something you could break up. Like I could buy an eighty thousand dollar package that was full with a hundred, two hundred cigars. I break it up, bro. You bought a, just a humidor that was eighty thousand. Well, it comes with it comes with one hundred and fifty cigars and a lighter and a cutter. <laughs> wow, uh, I'll sell it. They only made they only made like twenty of them, and they only have like they only have like five or six left this year. Anyways, they'll find you. Yep. And in the worst case scenario, I won't sell it. It'll be worth a quarter million in four or five years. There you go. Yep. Well, you break. You could probably break it up and sell the cigars. But uh, Michael, there, Michael, there's an agreement. Is going to be like fire next year. No, Ellie Blue and Fuente. They they put it in big bold letters and say you have to sell this as a unit. Mm. And when it doesn't really? sell after two years, right? I'm just saying. With that, is there it a time? breaks out to about five hundred twenty-five dollars a cigar. Not yep. that I've done the math. <laughs> I mean, I, I was nervous. That works. That works. There's five hundred dollars cigars. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's it. Pro you probably could easily command that. Is what I'm saying. I mean, granted, but, you'll comply, but I'm yeah. You know, the deal could be that if you buy that humidor, uh, you'll get a hundred thousand dollar discount uh, towards the lighter at Apes. No. <laughs> you know that they have. They better anybody who orders that lighter. It's got to be COD. Because you don't have <laughs> wire transfer. Get, maybe they'll give you the security. Did they give you the security guard? Wait, you, retailers in this industry, more than half, 
would coordinate some deal with some guy from Abu Dhabi or Dubai and say, hey, look, I got this $5 million letter. I'll sell it to you for a million dollars, and that store will be closed tomorrow. <laughs> it was paid. Oh, can U- you UPS, met- UPS is still dropping off without a signature. <laughs> Maybe it's different for you, Abe, but every time I sold one of those $10,000 humidors, I had to send an email to my credit card processor for them to process the payment to pay me. I can't imagine a $5 million payment. No, we sold a twenty-four. We sold a twenty-two thousand dollars Dupont last year. We it went through. We yeah, but I have one location, so I mean it goes through. But I have to just I have to show them the sales receipt, and I did it because for one store, ten thousand is considered an enormous purchase. I can't wait till you try to run that eighty thousand through. (laughs) Yeah, you gotta answer. We're gonna do a wire check. Cashier's check. No wire transfer and give it three days so they can't pull it back. Yeah, they they're not doing a check. Yeah, true. But I know a guy in Taiwan that I think has the money, and he's sent me wires before. So I don't know how the hell he gets to ship there, but that's some. I, I got a question. What day are we on? Uh, we're still on Saturday. Saturday. Oh, shit. Never yeah. Saturday. Oh. So, no, it'll roll. It's going to go a lot longer it'll, than I expected. It'll roll through pretty quickly. It'll roll yeah. through pretty quickly. Um, so let's talk about attendance a little bit. Uh, I would curious to get people's thoughts on attendance uh, over the overall and then kind of over the span of the four days and how, how you how you saw it and uh i'll start with uh coop um up overall uh definitely a downswing after the middle of the third day and the fourth day was obviously um fourth day was always the least traffic that's always been the case but it seemed like a lot of people came into that fourth day which is the four hours late and what I saw is in that last hour when we were covering booze, the, every booth we were trying to cover had a lot of activity going on. And we were really scrambling. I mean, there were orders being written and there were people waiting to do orders. So it wasn't quite like the ghost town of 2019 when Bolivar was closing their booths uh, in the morning. It, 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 there was more business going on. But again, it wasn't, it wasn't, you never, it wasn't, all the years I've gone, the last day has, ne- has always been kind of quiet. But this year, I thought it was an improvement over the last couple of years, that last day. Steve, how's traffic over on your side? Um, we were slammed the first two days. Um, and then the third day, it was about half as much as the first two days. And the fourth day, we didn't write very many orders on the fourth day at all. Um, we didn't do a lot of business. A lot of hanging out, though. Yeah, a lot of hanging out. But, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't write a whole lot on that last half day for us which I guess in some ways is, I mean, this is one of the things that you look at as a, an exhibitor. As you transition from being that third, fourth day company into the one, two day company, that's a good transition for you as a retail, as an exhibitor. That's what you want to see. And look, being a one, the first day company is really hard because when you had the big four there, they suck up a lot of that first day traffic, particularly with the big vendors. So not having the big four there makes day one for us like being shot out of a cannon. Um, and that's part, and this partially goes to where I was talking about the shift in the days. I, I really wish the show was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. You want to mm-hmm. be on, the, you want to be on a weekday to close because you have to pay for the, for the union labor and you don't want to pay the overtime on a Sunday. So I would much rather see the opening gala, whatever you want to call it on Thursday night. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I think you'd have a lot more retailers stay a little bit longer and then for the fourth day to be a real drop off, which would be okay with me. Um, but that, that's what I'd like to see. But for us, day one, day two, phenomenal. Day three was solid. Day four was barely anything for us. Oh, for you, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with what Steve said. I would love to see uh, Friday be the first day. Exactly what he said. Because it, it, he said it perfectly about the, if you have union labor on a, on a Sunday and you're packing up, it's, it's doomed for, for drayage and all this other work that you have to do. But um, yeah, one and two was great. The three was good. I actually had an employee leave. My main guy actually went back to Los Angeles, start punching numbers. Um, and it was, it still worked out fine because actually he didn't get a lot of work done at the booth because everybody wants to come up and say hi to him. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it, we're in a weird situation where everybody kind of knows Andy and everybody wants to talk to, hey, let's say hi to Andy. We, we haven't seen him in a while. Right. And meanwhile, he's trying to punch in sales orders, and that's not easy. Um, 
especially when you have, you know, a few hundred people trying to talk to you or, Hey, by the way, Dan didn't give me the deal. Can, can you give it to me? <laughs> so yeah, one and two, great. Three, very solid. Uh, four, of course, we were just wrapping up and, and I actually left midway on day three because I, I got a weird bug that I thought was COVID. I ended up testing six times in, in the period of two and a half days and tested negative every time. So I don't know what the fuck I got. All right, Abe and Jay, you guys walk in the floor, got to see kind of uh, various points of the floor. What were your thoughts on attendance? Um, attendance definitely up from last year. Uh, good attendance, you could tell. Normally, I don't believe anything the PCA normally releases. Sorry, Jay, but, you know, they talk about it being up every year, whatever, and they're like, like, but, you know, part of that problem was it's always hard to feel when the footprint in the show floor keeps getting bigger every year. Mm-hmm. It keeps looking more and more desolate. So having a smaller footprint, like this year, I don't know how it was, was the footprint this year bigger than last year? It was slightly bigger than last yeah, year. I think so. But definitely smaller than previous years. So you were able to really sense a, a increase in attendance. I've heard it from every manufacturer, which is another good sign. Um, somebody mentioned to me, I can't remember who it was, that, uh, you know, the first day being Saturday and Sunday, most people want to leave Sunday night to get back to work on Monday. Um so I don't know how that works. As far as a retailer, I think I could really get all my work done in three days. You know, I don't know if the half day is necessary. I don't know if the half day is really worth it for an extra day of paying for show floor time. I don't know if that's some kind of contract retirement requirement. But, you know, I think three solid days. The thing is, Abe, we need that half day as the manufacturer in order to be able to break down. So if Although- we broke down like Sunday night, and cut the show to three days even if you're on a weekday you're still way into overtime hours and that's yeah. the beauty that's the beauty of it breaking on you know on monday or on a weekday at one o'clock you then have a good four to five hours of non-overtime labor well, feel about a two and a half day show um yeah that would be tight i couldn't do it in two and a half days yeah i, yeah, I think that's really a retailer uh question because I, I've always heard the retailers were like, I can't get it all done within this short period of time. It, it, it takes me three days and, and I put in orders for my four largest accounts basically before the trade show floor open. And I still am busy three days, really the fourth day. Um, I usually do a couple of meetings, but mostly like I stopped by your booth, Pete, and said hello. I got to say hello and goodbye and spend some time with people, which you don't, you don't get to see people that often. I don't see Pete that often. I don't, see Carlito that often. I don't see George Padron that often. So uh, from a networking standpoint, that that last half day is good. Plus it allows me to go visit um, a couple of boots that maybe I couldn't get to. I went to a couple of boots where I didn't open accounts, but I got some samples. I got to learn about them. And that was helpful for me for preparing for the future. I spend the half day socializing mostly. Yeah, I would agree. A lot of it's that. Yeah. Uh, around socializing saying goodbye good to see you blah, blah, blah. you know that's what i spent the last half day doing but yeah i think it's i remember when i i worked retail when i was younger and i remember going to the trade show and that last day was really the day i would walk around to see everything that i missed yeah we did mostly just walk and look to see if we missed anything and said goodbye you know, as a retailer, you know, I think this is true even for Abe. There are people in the industry that you know and you admire and you like, and maybe for whatever reason, you don't carry their brand anymore, just from a business perspective. You still want to spend some time with those people because you never know you might do business again in the future. And you still want to maintain that relationship because uh, you can't do business with everybody that you know and like. So it gives you that time on the fourth day to do that as well. All right, I'll start with Abe and Jay on this topic, but um, this year there was some brands that had returned uh, to the trade show that had been on a hiatus for a year or maybe more. Um, uh, brands like Foundation, Villager, uh, people like that. Did, was that good to see those uh, companies return that you do business with? Um, you know, th- Did it matter to you if they were there at the show or not? Or how do you see it as them making a return? I thought it was great. I mean, although they've, they didn't like disappear. It was good to sit down with Manola at Casada and talk with him. And um, there were some other companies that didn't exhibit like 
foundation wasn't there. So I spent some time with, with uh, Nick at the Dorsey, but then to go in and, and see them. So it, it was good to see some people that had not been there last year, maybe the year before and catch up with them and see their products and spend time with them. That was very valuable. What are your thoughts, Dave? Um, look, I, I, I'm for anybody who's participated in the great, in the trade show. It's good for the trade show. Um, it's good for our industry. Um, I went to Nick's booth, had a talk with Nick because I want, I want to work on a project with. Um, you know, we didn't stop by Villager. And who was the other men- person you mentioned that came back? Uh, those are the two I mentioned. But um, Jay was saying, you know, Manolo was there. He he did he didn't attend the show last year. I did um, see a lot of cigars there. Um, and, and look, and, and look, it doesn't matter whether I buy from them or not. There's people who do buy for them, so it's so right. good for the industry. Um, and look, I, I I don't know, maybe Pete and Steve won't like me saying this, but you know, I'd eventually like to see some of the people who don't come back come back. Um, I agree. I think it's the yeah, better. I, I it's better for the too. industry. Yeah, I think it's better. I think it's better that everybody that's active. It, yeah, is it, there attendees to the trade show because I think it brings more retailers in. I, I think agree. it's more in. Look, it, we we can't shirk away from competition. I mean, yeah. competition. We all deal with it constantly. Uh, I'm, we're all in a battle for the same shelf space, regardless. I, I I'd rather see them participate in the trade show than not participate. Right. So let's face it. Like Altus is no less of a competition by not being in the trade show. Right. right. That is correct. And it's no. Like, yeah. It's not like Drew Estate's sleeping. Right. Right. Yeah, not at all. All right. So, um, well, Eric. one of the four came back this year, right? What? One Sorry. of the four. One of the four came back this year. Well, no, actually, all four of the four were there this yeah. year. Yeah, one was actually they were just, they, product, they were just there. They were just, they were just there roaming. Yeah, is what they were doing. Well, one was exhibiting product. He saw general because general sold products with Matt Boost Booth, and I really yeah. like that. If you're gonna participate, fucking participate. Yeah. They right. we- and I have an issue with, I heard a couple people had sweets off site that I don't like that either. I think that's kind of a scuzzy move. I think if, you're gonna, if you're going to, if you're going to be there and you're going to write orders and you're going to sit down with meetings, you should get a, you should pay for a booth in the show. You shouldn't pay for a suite in the Venetian and Since. invite people to your suite. I thought that was a pretty low thing to do. So yeah. People don't even do that. I've seen guys selling shit out of duffel bags, walking around trying to make sales at the trade show. That's uh-huh problem but we're not talking about those small guys we're talking about general cigar right general cigar should have taken a booth if you're gonna put your product in in matt booth stuff they they sold two brands uh uh, sancho panza and another one lsd most sonos deluxe yeah lsd take the damn booth that 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 that's i I agree with you on this one that was one of the things Uh, i think that i just really like left the uh, taste completely agree we don't want to be i don't know steve we don't, As a traditionalist, I really hate the fact that they took Los Status Deluxe and turned it into LSD. I did yeah, too. I know. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> but you would ever, who would ever think? <laughs> but seriously, why would you? Why would I mean? To, to me, that just made it made them look even worse. Yeah. You know, just yeah. take the damn booth. I mean, listen. The reality is, I'm, I'm a firm believer. I've been saying this now for almost eight months. One of the big fours coming back in, the first one does it, it's going to look like a hero. Yeah, Everyone yeah. Be like, oh, I guess we'll come back in now and whatever. Just my come- my yeah. prediction is two are coming back next year. That's yeah. my prediction. I, I think, I don't know, maybe it's me, but I, I think that it's, it's going to take a while before both Drew and Davidoff come back. I think Altanis in general will be there. I think Davidoff would definitely be the last one to come back. I think yeah. Drew made a lot of changes to their their think, model. The I, think, I don't think they could rip it apart next year easily to come to the trade show like they used to. Yeah, but you can come to the not like they used to, but that's what that way I copy edited that. Yeah, come to a trade show and get a twenty by fifty. You know what I mean? They can do that. Why can't they do that? Altidus will be yeah. back. Yeah, I, I think Altidus will come back, and I think look, Altidus in general, my two bets also that they would be the first two to return. General is already there. They might General, as well. Yeah, that's the, I, I'm officially saying one came back this year in my write-up. Well, I, I was happy to see Nick come back, and I yeah. was happy to see Mike and Skip come back on the floor. Yeah. And after last year, you know, they were like dead set against coming. It was nice to see them on the show floor. Again, Steve talks about competition. I mean, yeah, they're, they're, we're competing against each other. But, again, the more the better, the stronger we are. 
I know McAuliffe was back and I like to see Phillips and King back too, especially for smaller, newer retailers. Phillips and King is a pretty viable uh, company that should be on the trade show floor. We'd love to have them back too. I, I appreciated the way Skip positioned his booth side. As he said, we went as minimalist as possible while still being respectful, you know, and I thought that was, it was still respectful. I, I think it's just respectful to be, and look, I've never, I've never been shy about this. I and mean, look, we started off in a 20 by 20. We did that for two years and then we went 20 by 30 for like two years and we're now in a 20 by 40. And look, if in the future, if I need to scale it larger, I'll scale it larger. And if I need to shrink it, I'll shrink it. But I mean, the intent is that I would always, as long as there's a trade show, I'll, I'm going to come to the trade show. I mean, that, that, that's always been my perspective. The size of the booth is always going to depend on the ROI. I have to be pragmatic about it. Right now, 20 by 40 is a good size for my little company. That's a good size, you know? But hey, doesn't mean I won't have a larger booth in the future. Doesn't mean I won't have a smaller booth. Yeah. Interesting that uh, AJ Fernandez didn't show up this year. Uh, yeah, I think... Um, this statement last year, he wasn't coming, but then retracted and showed up and then didn't show up this year. Yeah, and you could go on the flip side. It was nice to see Ashton put a little bit more effort into their booth this year, right? And why yeah. Is that? Last year, I was right next to them, and that was just kind of like, wow, that's Ashton, really? Um, Thick. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's a mistake for Abdel not to come. Um, he makes so many cigars, but part of that, too, is so much of what he makes is sold by third parties, right? He doesn't really sell – it's not that he doesn't sell a lot of cigars as a A.J. Fernandez, but a vast majority of what he's been selling has been through STG and Altidus and – other third party people like Eric Espinosa and whatnot. So I can understand the logic, but I don't think you want to be known just as a contract manufacturer. I think, I think the placentias have proven that you can be both. Mm -hmm. Their booth was never empty. No. True. Their True. booth was never empty. I agree. I, sure I had to find another retailer to share their appointment time. And they were very happy to do. Otherwise, we could not have gotten into Sierra Rep. Placencia was slammed the whole show. Yeah. That was good. Yeah, in fact, the guys went to Placencia when I was at the press conference because it was so crowded. Yeah, I mean, that's that was the positive side of the press conference is you can see the uh, the tide go out on the floor. So that was our opportunity to rush to some booths and get some photos because yeah. otherwise there was a few booths we yeah. might not have been able to get photos of. That, 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 that is, the last two years, that's been a slam booth for sure. One of the busiest. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you got next, Aaron? Keeping you going. So uh, this topic is called, I called Spectacles. Uh, we already talked about the Fuente Padron announcement. Um, John and I were sitting down with Steve during that time frame, so uh, we did not participate, but I hope we heard that it was pretty wild in regards to people trying to get there. You guys have already talked a little bit about it. Hard to hear what was going on to, unless you were up front, I'm assuming. Yeah. There was a Bluetooth issue with the microphone. Right. So I heard every other word from George. It was it was like being in a mosh pit. It was right. it was uh I I there's some short lady next to me and I held the phone up for her for like 30 minutes. <laughs> it, it was uh it was pretty insane. Yeah. It was, it's still yeah. It, it's it just seems like vaporware to me at this point. Like it, I, I I like the fact that it was a something that was very interesting for people at the trade show, but um, just announcing something with no, no details. I and mean, we heard about it last year. This was just kind of like a small step, but it was still, there's nothing really tangible other than what was under that class. There kind of was. Fair, they had a box. But they, uh, they uh, changed the details, right? I mean, there were some details floating around, and then all of a sudden the details were no longer the details. I don't know. Me to follow. But it came out first in 2020. I didn't hear shit from it until this year. Right. Yeah, we, we opted our team opted not to go to the unveiling because we, we, we saw about an hour early what was happening and we opted not to um, because we, we just knew how it was going to be. So um, it was, it, you know, look, I still think this was very good for the industry to have that. What I kind of said is, you know, when you're looking to kind of really promote this industry, I mean, th th if, if the more you get out there with, with it, the better. And, it, it, and the media is the best way to do that. They really didn't do a great job with that because, you know, again, you know, the more out there, the better it is. And it was just tough to get anything good quality. I, I even think if they stream that a good video, 
it would have been great because people would have gotten to see that and maybe see what they missed at the trade show. Boop. I don't think they getting a job out of it because they don't know what's going on yet. I think it's, you know, I think this was, yeah, I, think, I think you're right. Yeah, I agree. I love both the, the families, legendary families, yeah. legendary families, as far as I'm concerned, but let's face it. Some of the slowest moving companies in this industry. Right. So this was announced in 2020, right? Two years later, they show the product, and there's absolutely no information about when it's shipping, who's shipping it, the cost, the price. I mean, this was, hey, we need to address something because it's been two years since we talked about it. So we need to do something in 2022, and it got, this is what they did. But I'm still saying, this is not hitting the market till 2024. Yeah. All right. Uh, next one I had already brought up was the El Septimo five and a half million dollar lighters. Um, so, Abe, did you get a chance to uh, play with that thing? I got a chance to hold it. Oh. Do you have like superpowers for a certain time frame after that now? Was it the greatest lighter you ever held? <laughs> what are you going to do when your million dollar torch lighter doesn't work? <laughs> Send it in the car. I don't know. Are you going to tell your customer who buys it? Well, if it doesn't work. Oh, you get. Listen, they, they got to come back to you what? on it, right? Yeah, do they do they bring like a Ferrari mechanic in to fix right. it? <laughs> <laughs> we're getting Zaya on our KMA show. If you talked with him and you had a chance to talk to him, he's a super interesting fellow, right? Yeah. Legitimate yeah. self-made gajillionaire, and you know has a lot of legitimate great stories. And you know when you're at that level, I guess hey, let's make a five million dollar lighter. Things got rubies, pearls, this that on it. Um, I didn't have my picture taken with it, which everybody was lining up to do, which I thought was kind of silly. Yeah. Um, but well, Instagram heroes and stuff, I'll give yeah. a lot of credit though. It creates a lot of buzz. I yeah. mean, I mean, the bottom line is it's a lighter. So you know that the damn thing you're at the bleeding and be blowing in it to get it to work. <laughs> right. It doesn't matter what lighter it is. Cause they're all the same. <laughs> you know? yeah. You got a million dollar bottle of booze. <laughs> He gave my wife some three thousand dollar duffel bag made of like uh, python, ostrich, and suede. I mean, look, hey, well, well, like one of the ones that looked like a Bergen bag. Bro, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. <laughs> what's funny was he gave it. True story. He gave me the duffel bag. I placed the order. I saw. It, I'm like, man, that's a gorgeous duffel bag. He goes, take it. I said, okay, thank you. I took the I took the duffel bag. So my wife was in the room when I met him and placed the order. Later, she comes on the floor and Tanya Borschwitz meets up with my wife. And Tanya takes him over to meet him. They start talking, and I guess Tanya had a purse. So he went and he gives my wife a purse. And my wife's carrying around this bag, and he pulls me aside. He goes, "Why? You know that woman has your bag?" I'm like, "That's that's my wife." So what he didn't know was he gave <laughs> bags, gave one to me and one to my wife, not knowing who she was. But look, he's got a great story. Um, they're gonna have a market, you know. I, I the product improved a lot as far as look. One of my issues was last year when I saw them was to be that kind of level of product, right? That's an upper echelon kind of thing. You know, Davidoff has done really good at it, but nothing can look janky or chintzy. And some of the stuff looked just janky and chintzy. That's you know, where Nelson has such an advantage over so many people. Mm -hmm. Stuff that Nelson Afonso does is just stunning. Oh, that guy's brilliant. You can just tell by just looking at his stuff, right? So I don't think they're quite there yet, um, but we smoke the cigars. Actually, you know, I don't care. Everybody's going to knock stuff. My wife, the Lancera she smoked, and my wife's always had a good palate. She's picked some of the greatest winners of all time from the trade show when they were released, whether it was Oliva V or the Singulari series. She says, this is awesome, and it was a big hit. Um, the Lancero he gave her, I couldn't even tell you what line it is right now. She she loved it. Um, so, you know, to bring it in, give it a crack, give it a try. It's not the end of the world. But if we're going to talk about stuff that like, I, I was really impressed with, and I talked a little bit about this on KMA. Um, I'm going to have to mention P2, right? I think seeing what Dion's doing with his repackaging and his Absolutely. Mom, I was most impressed with the trade uh, show. I, 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 told, I, I agreed with you on that. A lot of people disagreed with me on this. Jesus Christ, it needed it, man. Because yeah, the new yeah. consumer had no idea. Yeah. It's like looking at a scavenger map. The new consumer, I mean, if you're following Dion from the beginning of time, right? You know, you kind of got it. <laughs> but there's a new guy walking in trying to understand that brand was lost so to see him kind of streamline everything and you know pete i said it saturday in our show you, did, I, <laughs> you know i mean so I, I gotta be able to say it to your face i think you're next bro you gotta <laughs> listen to me i ain't gonna lie when we were doing our warehouse i had to call pete up 
because I'm going to other people's website. Like Pete, how would you like your products listed? Because I, I don't know. <laughs> It. Do I make it one category? Do I make it two categories? Do I make it made in Miami, made in Nicaragua? Because everywhere I look, it's done differently. It's too hard to comprehend. And once again, if you're one of the guys who have followed Pete since the beginning of time, you know, you've grown with it. Well, I mean, we're, we're making one change next year. It's a very simple change, and it's, it's just going to set the Miami product aside a little bit. But uh, it's, we're not going crazy with it for sure. As a new consumer coming in, it's another hard one. So I love the fact that that stuff I think is coming till 2023. But I, 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 that was one of the things that I saw at the show that really like I went out with like, Jesus, thank God. I think uh, it's going to be good for me as a retailer. I think it's going to be good for him as a brand. I think it's going to be good for, you know, uh, consumers who are maybe unfamiliar with the brand, seeing it for the first time. So that was one of the things that really yeah. caught me at the trade show this year. Yeah, and I'll just say for the people who are negative on it, when you see it in person, you're going to get it. At least that was my point of it. I agree with you on this, Ava 100. Well, the thing that got my attention was, and I know Coop doesn't like cigars and mazos, but pork tenderloin really got my attention. But that's uh, a that's a smaller product. release. It's different, yeah. Well, uh, it's not that it's small. Of it. <laughs> okay, I then I have to bet on Pete, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it goes with the theme of the, of the branding. So, yeah. I don't know. You, you, it's just the way it works. So, Steve, yeah. but you, ahead, exhi- you exhibited so pictures of what the cigar lo- you had the cigar on display on, at the show and all that. And, you know, it's a lot. It's so people were, at the retailers were ordering it, were able to see the cigar. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, another one was Guy Fieri at the Espinosa booth. That seemed to be a big draw as well. Huge. They seemed organized with it. Yeah. Um, they were very, you know, and I was wondering if, how that was going to go, but they had that like a well-oiled machine from what I saw. Did you get a chance to stop by JRA when he was there? I saw him when he was at the PCA booth and that was quite a long line, Yeah. which by the way, I liked the fact that PCA had a booth. Uh, I wish we had some more chairs, but that, that was nice uh, each day. And when they had guy there, it was a madhouse. I was part of the team that went to escort pulled up because i have a relationship with him i know him he actually he bought a house not too far from our headquarters here in boynton beach um just look I, I, i've had very quiet intimate long moments with guy whether it be when i was over at his house or i drove him down to la palooza him and his son um guy is not your typical guy who's gotten into this industry for a licensing deal guy likes this industry he likes the cigars he doesn't mind being involved. He doesn't mind showing up. Let me tell you something. This is one busy motherfucker. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know his schedule because I've tried to schedule a couple of things with him. And, you know, when he's talking to you, this guy's all over the place. Um, but he's a guy I don't think that just wants to license his name, which I think is great for our industry. Um, and he's not afraid. I, you know, he's out there wearing his knuckle sandwich T-shirt doing other things. So he's not afraid to say, hey, I, I'm part of this industry, which I think is good for us um it'd be nice if we can get i know nick has um joe rogan joe rogan yeah uh, and joe rogan's constantly talking about it it'd be great to get him on a trade show man get the dude in here get the guy involved i mean i think guys like that will always help not just our cause but like you know we talked about we talked about cra and i can't remember where i talked about it i think maybe it was with rocky last year i was on a debate but you know all you need is a guy like joe rogan to say, look, man, we'll get behind our industry and say, look, send five dollars to the CRA. That dude can get fifty thousand, eighty thousand people to send five dollars to the CRA. It's more money they'll make through any campaign or any of these ten packs they're making. These guys have these guys have a real tangible power that can be used if we can get them more involved and more enthralled in our industry. And I think Guy Fieri could be a guy like that. I'm hoping Joe Rogan could be a guy like that. And 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 that stuff is stuff that i believe personally could really benefit our culture i i agree that the, the, the guy's involvement uh brings more people to the culture and i love the fact that he's so involved with it but when you see celebrity brands you know 90 percent of the time or even 99 percent of the time those celebrities don't even want to participate they don't want to show up they don't want to they don't care they just want to it's a vanity thing for them that doesn't work that's it yeah <laughs> beginning of time that doesn't work you got to really feel part of it and from what i've seen so far guy has showed it every way he came to our great smoke this year he did la, Palo- la zona palooza he's come to a trade show 
You know, yeah. this is a guy who doesn't want to just license his name, which I think is, is, is a good for us. And if we can get a guy like that, another couple of guys like that who just really want to be part of the culture and not just license their name, I think it'd be huge. And we could tap in one guy who could really do some powerful work. Like you get the right guy. Like I said, you know, the CR, the, the CRA or PC, they're trying to raise 20,000 here and 10,000. Man, one guy could tell his followers, look, we need $5 sent from everybody. If you're a cigar smoker and you follow, that, that could be a quarter million dollars in an instant. Yeah. Yeah. That's yep. Some yep. real raising money power. Yeah. Steve, I see you blinking. Talk. No, I, look, I can't disagree with anything. I think the more people we have involved, I mean, look, obviously, Everybody wishes they could get a unicorn. You got to give kudos to those people that did. Um, but yeah, I, I don't see any negatives of it, to be honest with you. And, and the nice thing about it too is, it is this is the thing. And I think this is the part that maybe most people wouldn't understand. You would think that, oh, I would be really upset that I don't have Guy Fieri, but Eric has Guy Fieri. But that's not the way this works. Because the way it works on our business is consumers will start on one brand and they will then expand to other brands. And eventually that consumer is going to settle on the brand they like to smoke the most. So it doesn't matter what brings them into the circle. They may start with you in the circle and they may end with you in the circle, but getting people into the circle is really what the goal ultimately is. And that's the way I always felt even when I was president of Drew Estate. I mean, I never smoked acid. I didn't like acid, but I think we can all say that acid has contributed in a big way to bring a lot of adults into the cigar industry into cigar smoking and then those consumers they end up moving on to tatuaje and they end up moving on to something else eventually so i think anything that brings interest in a positive way is collectively good for all of us agreed yep. i also thought it was brilliant of espinoza to do another guy fieri release at the show another knuckle sandwich because you know it's always what's new and now you offered something else for the retailers under this knuckle sandwich line so I thought that was a brilliant move by them to kind of continue that um, going forward. I think that's going to just keep the momentum of the brand going. Yep. Mama, so see, this is where you and I might disagree. I always worry about, are you stepping on your show too early? You know what I mean? They did an LE though. They did it as Knuckle an LE. sandwich is new already. Yeah. I'm sure it's good for the retailers, but. They did an I mean, LE release. They did it as an LE, which I think was I think actually smart. Letting things percolate a little bit sometimes really helps. Because you launch things sometimes and they, they take a little time to catch on, you know? So I'm always, that's something that I'm just always concerned about as a brand owner is just, I don't want to step on myself. I don't want to short my sales on something else with something new all the time. What, what's nice about a Guy Fieri is, is, is literally we, we, we walked downstairs to go escort him in. It was him and his driver. And it was like about five of us. And, you know, um, as he's getting out of his car, I will let him in. I see a big billboard on a hotel thing with his face on it. So you got a guy who's just relevant today yes. and tangible today. That's that that's in this status. He's not like you know. I don't want to mention anybody's name, but not like you know, a C list or a washed up actor involved in our industry. This guy's extremely relevant in today's universe. So oh, and he has mass appeal. Mass appeal. It's and current. When you meet him, it's even better. You know, you know, when you meet some of these guys, you get let down. You're like, what a jerk off. This guy is. Oh, I can tell he was great. Yeah, he was. Art. I could see how he connects with people and everything. I didn't really know much about him beforehand, believe it or not. I just knew of him, but I had never really followed him. And I sent a picture to my daughter and her husband's like, I want to try that cigar of his. You know, and he's a casual smoker. So it's someone he got interested in it right away. Well, that's what you hope. Is yeah. Some Fieri fans out there who aren't really in the cigar universe, but hardcore fans is will say, Oh, he has a cigar. Well, yeah. let me try it. And mm -hmm. like Steve says, anything that cultivates new cigar smokers, I'm in for. Yep. You know, just on a tangent, when I first got in the business, I opened up my second location. You know, all of a sudden, cigar shops started popping all over the place. And I used to get an ulcer every time a cigar shop opened up. And then I started to realize that my business keeps getting better and better. So I got to the point where I realized, well, these guys are cultivating every shop that opens will cultivate some percentage of a new smoker. Mm -hmm. People would either find us because we did it better or we had inventory or whatever the reason is. So I stopped getting upset when cigar shops opened around us because most of the time they would cultivate more smokers and a percentage of those would find us eventually. So absolutely anything that keeps bringing people into the, this industry is a positive as far as I'm concerned. 
Uh, another spectacle was the uh, Sasquatch poo and Steve's booth. <laughs> I don't know about spectacle. I saw Abe with a whole suitcase full of it. What happened there? I didn't get any. It all went in that. It all went in that crocodile went duffel bag. I went through a thousand bags of that in less than three days. How that's crazy. why we were there on day four. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> Stupid idea. <laughs> or was Sokka 3, the final chapter? <laughs> uh, Steve, my kids both loved it. <laughs> you, you know, I got at least... Candy. I've gotten at least 20 messages from people that said, hey, my kids absolutely love that cotton candy yep. and how much they appreciate that I brought them something back. Aaron. <laughs> it's kind of surprising. My daughter loved it. <laughs> yeah, I loved the photo too. It was really cool. Yep. I'm going to share that photo, uh, but uh, yeah, surprise stuff is nasty. <laughs> I, guess, I guess if you're 12, it's perfect. <laughs> uh, so any other things at the show that caught your eye that you thought was interesting? Um, probably me more for uh, Abe and Jay and Coop and, and John since uh, Steve and Pete probably didn't leave your booth all that much. I know that Casa 1910 had a huge bottle of tequila. I know Pete was waiting for it to open. Um, yeah, and they never opened it. <laughs> it, no. it. That was a company that I had decided to bring in their, their one SKU last year, and I was happy to see them bring in some more SKUs. I think that company's got some potential. And uh, although they didn't really have the mariachi band the whole time, I think that they generated some interest as a newer company. Uh, the less mariachi. The accessories. <laughs> Stellar, the ashtrays and some of the new stuff. Yeah, yeah, it no, was. the Talavera really stuff was. is beautiful. Yeah, the Alfonso looked. I mean, it's stuff I want on my deck. Literally, I saw that Alfonso ashtray. I want that on my patio. So the accessories that everybody's going to be coming out with the ashtrays and stuff like that look gorgeous. Uh, Jay and Abe, did you get a chance to throw that new Zycar cutter? That one with the, like the thumb wheel on it. The only cutter I saw, I didn't get a chance to go to Zycar. What were they in the okay. quality imports? I yeah. Grabbed. Yeah, but that day I was stuck somewhere else. Um, but I saw that cutter that Steve was using, that scooper. Yeah. Oh yeah, the cigar medics. I saw it. I was impressed by it. I saw it was in a hundred, hundred. I think it's a hundred twenty five dollar retail. Like, ooh. Um, and I actually think it's too cheap for what it costs to make. Well, that's. I mean, listen. I'm not saying it's not a solid piece of metal that's made here in the U.S. Look, look, look. Here's the thing: as a retailer, and I'm all for it, right? I try to get stuff made in the U.S. or and whatnot. But at the end of the day, the reality is most of the consumers who cry made in the USA don't give a shit when it comes to pricing. They forget all that shit. There are a percentage who'd rather pay more money and have something made in the USA. But at the end of the day, on a mass level, most of the consumers and they will just cry about the price and rather have something cheaper and then they forget about who or where it's made. That's what I see on the retail level. I don't know about you, Jay. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, we've seen that with the cigar from J.C. Newman, the American. Guys are like, oh, I want to buy it. And then you tell them the price and they freak out. And you have to start not talking that patriotic. about wages and whatnot. <laughs> That's and, exactly. uh, Derek, I'm not that patriotic. It's exactly- <laughs> I, I'm sorry. How much are those cigars? I didn't. Yeah, that, that, that part sucks to hear that. Yeah. Because that cigar is not outrageously. No. Expensive. Not That's at all. Like I said. Yeah. Eighteen dollars, something like oh, that. Yeah, dude, that's, yeah. that's any piece of crap I make. What are we talking about here? Yeah, I don't <laughs> it, the thing is, is it was before its time. Like this, <laughs> this last eighteen months, all the cigars are kind of starting to hit that range. So, like, yeah. they were just a little bit ahead of the curve, I think. Yeah. Speaking um, of which, I'm pretty excited about the new uh, Angel Cuestra, or however you pronounce it. I smoked one of the Bench Sap a couple of years ago, and that cigar is probably going to be in that price range and more available than the American. I think uh, what Drew Newman's doing to have more cigars made in the United States is awesome. And I think that's a good positive trend. I know Pete's been doing it for years and I know a few other companies make cigars in the U S so that that's cool to see. Any other exciting things that you saw at the show? We'll move on to the next topic. Here's my thing was calling out exciting stuff. The trade show. There was so much though. Mm -hmm. There was just so much. I mean, it's like really hard. I mean, you, you, you say, hey, you, you're interested in what Ricky Rodriguez is doing with West Tampa. You're interested in what Mike Kirklotz is doing with his thing. You had Tim there with his new thing. CAO, I mean, they had quite a rework going on and they had a lot of different stuff at CAO. I mean, Pete, I don't know if this is true or not. People keep telling me you had 11 new things. Is that true? Uh, well, technically nine facings. 
Yeah, so there you go. I mean, everybody- a few, a few limited editions. Right, I mean, so everybody had a lot of interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think there was really a shortage of interesting. I think the question is going to be, of all of this, what if it's going to ultimately float to the top and, and survive and go to the next step? I mean, I think that's going to be, and that's going to be a question that's ultimately determined by consumers and retailers. But I don't think there was a shortage of interesting products at this year's trade show. And that's just amongst the, the bigger players. And if you start getting out into the hinterlands, like I said earlier, I mean, there were like 20 or 30 like brands that were like almost like totally fresh, totally new, something different. Now, something different worthwhile, I don't know, because obviously I'm probably very much like Pete. I, I just don't leave my booth at all during the trade show unless I'm going to take a piss. So, um, but I, I, don't, I don't think there was a shortage of interesting products at the trade show. If anything, there was almost too much, mm-hmm. so much. Glad you brought up Tim Ozinger because, like, you know, we've had that, you know, where are they now segment of Cam Man? He was always that guest. I think we've had him twice now on as where are they now? And he was one of the guys that I really said, man, this guy made it out and really didn't come back in. But sure enough, he made it back in. So I think I think right now in my in my universe, I think Michael Cusano is the last man standing as somebody who's made it out and really kind of stayed out of the spotlight of the yeah. cigar industry. But Tim was one of those. I really thought Tim was never coming back. I did make the joke with Mike Condor and, and Huber that uh, why it took them so long to tell everybody that Tim was still an investor of their company. I don't get <laughs> yeah, <we talked> about <laughs> I was gonna say that. a while back, but he was really quiet. He wasn't uninvolved. You know, I'm sure he helped them start it up and wanted to, you know, support his buddies and his co former employees, but for him to come back out now full fledged with a full fledged line and a limited edition, I, t- I tell you, man, I really thought he was going to be the one that, that made it out, but nope, he's back. Uh, but I think he's back in a really hard way because I was, somebody had shared to me their sell sheets. And I mean, if you bought into that package, it's like Tim's coming to your store to do an event. So Tim, Tim is going to be visiting a lot of stores is what it looks like. That's only if you want Tim to come and do your store, you had to buy like this certain whole package. But it wasn't a giant buy-in. It wasn't massive. Yeah. I'll tell you. Mm-hmm. When are you showing up in your story? Make sure you're talking to MSRP here, Dave. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't remember that deal. Probably, probably better than the alternative, though. Of, you know, selling a number of facings and then just having it die on the shelf and uh, kind of relying on the retailer to to tell the story. Obviously, if Tim can be there to tell the story of the cigar and the brand, I mean, if he's available, I mean, I don't know how quick he's going to get burned out doing that many stores, but. If I was a retailer, I'd certainly want to be top of that list. Yeah, he's done it before. It's a hard grind, though. I mean, no, like, it wasn't a huge package to have him. I mean, it wasn't a. It really thing. wasn't. I think it was. I didn't think it was very. Let me say this: I wouldn't come to your store for that. <laughs> hey, hey, Abe. Yeah. When I messaged you a few months ago, right? Did you have any inkling of that? That what? that was. I know you know Tim. I messaged you saying, "Hey, look at this," and I sent you the thing about the, the you know. The trademarks and stuff because that started leaking out a couple months ago oh i had no inkling because I, I it seemed like you didn't like i i can usually tell if you're bluffing but it didn't seem like you were bluffing you were completely surprised when i showed you that no i was you did send me something was that text or messenger i can't remember coop yeah i think it was a text it yeah a text guy let me see i said hey look at this and this is back uh march i think yes yeah, that means there's way too much information out there now Do you get alerts yeah. coop like you get alerts from the um, USPTO, anything in class 34? I mean, look, we in the media, we've kind of always known to do a little digging, but um, it, it really, I didn't figure it out until Miguel April, came on our show and said he's going to distribute someone. April <laughs> so, 4th, Coop sent me a message with the trademark for Ozinger Family Cigars with, with a quote, nobody ever leaves the cigar business. And I replied, wow. So, I, was <laughs> so it was early April. It was early April. April 24th. Okay, so uh, it's April. Okay. Yeah, April 24th. Uh-huh. You know, an interesting product that, uh, Pete, you might have some information on this, but, you know, th- my father decided not to sell the Florida Las Antillas uh, 10th anniversary yet, but those jars looked amazing. And Yeah, the jar, I, I can tell you that the jar, from what I know, is not a thing. Oh. It, was, it was a sample jar that they had put in the, the booth for, for decoration. Uh, but was, th- I'm sure, you never know. I, I, they, I, I can't tell you yes or no on that one. 
they knocked it out of the park with that uh the labor 200 they really did yeah that was a fan i got to smoke it it was fantastic I, I guess i don't know the right people i i didn't ask or get a sample of that but i would imagine <laughs> i asked you yeah you gotta <laughs> i would imagine though with that you know being his father that uh, they're going to do a great job on that uh that company's just humming yeah it, it was really it, it's i think that's a really special cigar but i do that. agree with what abe was saying earlier i think some of the ashtrays and the products that they had at the selected tobaccos was pretty impressive I know a lot of media guys didn't talk to them, but Oli I think what Oliva is doing right now is, is huge. And I got a chance to talk to them at the trade show. And this is just the beginning of what they're doing with the, with the uh, brands they got, you know, the Cuba Aliados and the Puros Indios. Hey, listen, you talk, talk about a booth that was busy the entire time. I mean, it was really not yeah. till the fourth day. I mean, you know, we, we might've poked fun in previous years, but uh, they were packed uh, yeah. all the way through to day yeah. three to the end. They were but did, completely but They full. scaled the size down a bit. That's that makes true. A difference. I mean, and, and that's the problem. And I always say this to people, you you know, you have a house party with 50 people and you got in a 1200 square foot house and it's slamming and jamming. You got an 8,000 square foot house and it doesn't look like much. You know what I mean? So you got to make the booth. You got to think about the size of your booth as to also how it appears too, traffic wise, because I don't think that necessarily you're writing more business. It just looks like you're writing more business. But, but I will but, say in 2019, Steve, a 10 by 20 wouldn't have made any difference. It still would have been completely yeah, well, empty. And, by and, and they packed up early on day four a couple few years ago in 2019. Yeah, I mean, yeah. for a company that hasn't had a lot of new releases the last few years, I mean, Oliva had, I smoked both of the, uh, both Ernesto's and Jerry's blend of the Cuba Aliotis, and they were both good. Yeah. And I'm kind of excited. I bought a few samplers just so I could get some Melania Lanceros. Uh, so, you know, that was unusual to see so much new product from Oliva. Yeah. So, and, and it sounded like this is going to be a trend over the next few years. I, I think. Who's, who's it's, it's, selling it's, the product that's made by Eladio? What Freud. brands are those? Oh, Freud. 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 Freud has Freud, one. Because yeah. I, didn't, I didn't hear a lot about those guys. Uh, I smoked a couple of the samples. Uh, they're not quite ready yet, but they, they, they were good. Okay. They had a nice presentation and everything too. Yeah, we got our Freud boxes like bef right when we got back from the show, and uh, they did a pretty good job. Yeah. Though I don't think Eladio was involved in the blending of the actual Super Ego. No, that was uh, Ventura. Yeah, but he did a very good job with that. Yeah, the packaging is gorgeous. Pack I should say I haven't smoked the cigar, but he did a really good job with the uh, uh, the packaging on that. And I think a lot of that was him. All right, we're getting close to wrapping up here, guys. Uh, the industry party on Sunday night. Um, I didn't attend. Did anybody here attend that event? I don't think so. Party night where? Yeah, what exactly. Party? Or whatever. The, At the college kind of the, college. the you know the whole party they do during the nights of the trade oh, show. Oh yeah, they were doing it was that at some club yeah. yeah. Anytime you have to get people to leave that leave the uh, the hotel, that's always a tough one. Yeah. Although Christian's party was slammed. We were at Christian's party, and that was slammed the same night. Hurrah. Where was that? Where was uh, it? That was over at 8, over at Resorts. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, people, because people you tell people go you go to a cigar club, and people are going to yeah, go. People yeah. want to go visit 8 anyways. I haven't even they, been in the joint yet, so it's on my but I, I think if they would have had a, a sponsored cigar over at Cosmo, that probably would have worked better. It just It was too much of an unknown. People really didn't know like what they were going to get and to go all the way over there. That was some of the things I heard. And I heard, I heard, and Jay, you may be able to talk more. I heard it wasn't well attended is what I heard. Yeah. Uh, well, part of the confusion was that I, I didn't know, and I was on the trade show committee that you could smoke. I didn't know that it was a pool. I, when they said soaked after dark, I thought it was like going to be a. That's a, what I thought. Yeah. But I know Joshua said that he went and he said that it wasn't very well attended um, the PC, we could have done a better job on that. I mean, uh, we need to improve on some of those things. No question. Yeah. Well, let's put it. Scott was over at the Aroa party. Oh. I saw Scott at the Aroa party. So I, I tell you, I went to dinner at yeah. Mandalay Bay, uh, for El Septimo and the, the food and the, the, it was, it was a nice dinner. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but that was nice to get out and have sort of an old fashioned Ashton dinner for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, definitely had Chip's fingertips on it. I was frustrated though that it took about three minutes of speaking for Chip to start dropping f bombs. <laughs> we're worried about him, and then Zaya said, "No, he's allowed to use whatever language he wants." And then, then Chip just started letting go, and it was old Chip, so that was good. 
My guys went to that dinner. They said it was me. I think part of the problem, Abe, and not to cast aspersions, that they had some good cigars there, but they weren't properly humidified. Um, but the chocolate dessert was worth the price of admission. They said the steak was like sawdust. Really? Oh, I had a good one. I, I don't know. I went. I mean, listen, I, I'm the worst guy to be having this conversation with because <laughs> we had just got back from being like 45 days away. My wife, my listen to me. Look, I love my children. I have a deep affinity for my kids, but like that was the most time I spent around them morning till night every day for 45 days in a house that's like one eighth our normal size house so I never got a break for them so like going to Vegas was like I told my wife I, I need to go just so I can fall back in love with them so you know my wife <laughs> literally my wife and I just kind of it's <clears throat> just for the two of us like every night so we I didn't I, I purposely let my go out to any kind of function they wanted to go to I just had my mommy and daddy time with Brandy. And I think on the very last night, I was supposed to hang out with Sokka. And we went to the pool, me and a bunch of people. I, I literally got so fucked up. I passed out on the bathroom floor and never made it to Sokka's dinner that last day. Broke my heart. Yeah, I'm really sure. Did. Yeah, I'm sure. Steve, well, the check's clear. I don't give a fuck. You don't have to come to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's something, it's funny you say this because, you know, it's something we've been struggling with as a company. As we grow, we start to feel like we should be doing something like that. But the problem is we're still so undermanned that we're all so exhausted. And it's like, there's not like we have, like literally to pull something like that off, you almost need like a full-time dedicated person and maybe even two people to make something like that really happen for it to go well. You have to literally hire a third-party event planner and let them plan it for you. Otherwise, mm-hmm. a whole other fucking job for you at the trade show. Yeah, because it's just it's so hard. Because I, I know, like, after day one, Cena and I, we walked into Yardbird and just said, do you have a table? We sat down. We ordered an entree. We ate it together as zombies. We didn't say a word through the meal. And that was it. No drinks, no anything, water, some calories, swallow it down, go up to the room and collapse. Because it's really, it's it's pretty exhausting doing the trade show. It really is. And as I get older and fatter, it becomes an even bigger challenge. For me. Amen. I mean, it's just, it's really, it's, uh, I, I really start to under, you know, it's kind of funny because I used to always see guys like Manny Casada and Juan Martinez Cuenca and Ernesto Perez Carrillo. and be like, man, why aren't they hanging out? Why aren't they doing this? And I, I, I now understand it. You get to a point where like, okay, I'm Gilberto Oliva Sr. I just want to go back to my room is what I want to do. You know what I mean? And I, I get it. All right. So I'm going to wrap up for the trade show this year. Any other topics that you guys wanted to bring up about the trade show that just passed that we didn't cover? There's one little minor pet peeve of mine, Jay. I would really like for, and I, I put this in my comments in the survey, the website just so sucked for being an exhibitor and planning. I'm sure Pete doesn't have to handle it, but I am the guy. In the no, room. I do. I, I do it all. <laughs> it is so confusing. Half the links don't work. You got different information on different pages. I just really wish you guys would beta test that with an exhibitor that actually puts together, because we all know what we have to do and the things that we all need to do. It could be so much better. And it was, kind of, it was actually better three years ago than it was this year. And this really? year is actually worse than last year's. You got half the links to actually work. I, I mean, I, I, when I tried to vote for people on the board, it kept logging me out. And uh, yeah, it, for lack of a better word, it's a known issue. I, I think that we need to improve on our website in general, and we need to improve on a lot of that technical stuff. I think you'll see improvements in the next few years. Uh, we've just, we've been undermanned and we need to uh, increase our staff. There's, you're right. I mean, our, our website is uh, not very good. Well, if you guys need a guy, I got a, I finally found a really good guy. So, and he's pretty, he works cheap and he loves cigars. So there you go. Well, send me a name and I'll forward it on yeah. or just send it to Scott. Is that, I just wish that part was a little smoother because it's a big point of frustration when you're trying to do the planning for the trade show. And it's like, like, you know how hard it was to find the map of the trade show floor. Oh, hey, Steve, how, about, how about ordering the electricity? Oh, impossible. <laughs> <laughs> And I had to register every booth, every every badge for the booth. I know, and it, it, it's just it's just all a little kludgy, and it's it, it's really frustrating. Yeah, but get out the violin, Abe. 
Come on. Hold on. I got it. We, we put that we put that on ourselves, actually. We yeah. we should probably hire one extra person to do that shit. <laughs> but it's it's funny, you know, Coop and Abe and I think Ivan has signed a grade to the trade show. And I was thinking about this before I got on. <laughs> I would say that we actually did what we're supposed to do this year. And there certainly could be an improvement. Whereas I felt like in the past, you know, we didn't do a very good trade show. I felt like this year we did what we needed to do, but still there's a lot of areas to improve, but I'm well, glad that it is, it's Jay, you did the most important thing. I think there were more people there and people were in a generally good mood. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's going to mean that we're going to get all of those people back next year. And I think there'll yeah. be a lot of people that even hearing these post PCA reviews, this is a much different segment. Yeah. Cause I've done these for quite a few times yep. in the past. And this has got to be the most positive panel that I have heard on this topic in a long time. And I agree. We had a lot yeah, of we had a lot of fucking negative bastards in this. Yeah, do, yeah don't it's, worry. Not, got, it's not I a got, giant got, bitch fest. So. I got a native yeah. question next. So, uh, okay, but you led into it with the website stuff, and this is same questions that we did it kind of wrapped up with last year. Um, the first question is what absolutely needs to change with the PCA organization or the trade show for next year. And so this isn't necessarily just like just complaining time, but like, what do you think is a very high priority item that should be changed coming out of this one that they should put in for next, for next year? We already heard mine. Look, the thing that I would like most change is the dates, but we can't change those. Those are locked into a contract. Yeah. So I just like for that to be a future consideration for the next contract to go Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. I think that would be just best for everybody. I, think- I agree with that. My two things, um, I think I mentioned sponsorship. I think if you could improve the value, get more value out of the sponsorship, it's going to feed more money into the trade show. It's a good thing. And then I think they still need some help with the social event planning piece. Yeah. So, um, And I think, look, I'm not trying to knock anyone. They had a lot on their plate this year with a small staff. And I think they did it. Like I said, people want to come back to this trade show who were there. And I think that was a that, that's a huge – uh, hurdle that this trade show overcame. So I think if, I think those two things, if they can work on those two things, it will pull it up from a V next year. Yeah, I would agree. And I don't know if you know this, Coop, but uh, when, when was the press conference? That Monday morning? Yeah. Uh, Monday yeah. morning, yeah. Yeah, Monday morning before that started, Aaron got a call. So Aaron was basically out of the loop and Scott Pierce and Lisa were doing her job the last two days uh, because of COVID. Um, yeah, I agree. We, we need more staff. Scott's definitely aware of that. Uh, we just don't have enough bodies right now. I'm actually amazed that it came off as well as it did, given the number of bodies that we had. Yeah. They, I mean, honestly, I think the confidence level improved. And I got some like. I'll tell you a stupid thing that doesn't matter to anybody, but probably Pete and me. But it's nice for us to be able to pick our next trade show booth on the trade show floor and not yeah. have to leave the trade show floor, go a million miles away to the other room. So, I mean, these little things, they don't sound like a big deal. But they make a real difference that I could actually pop, pick my trade show booth for next year. Took me took me out of my booth maybe fifteen minutes, twenty. Yeah, minutes. we got really we got really lucky with that too because we we had we had our day to pick our booth uh, Friday during setup, so it actually worked out yeah. good. And that's where the sponsorship comes in into play for us because we get all those priority points and booth size points, and we were able to move up. To the front list, I think we were the third. My father and Tatawai were the third and fourth companies to pick their booth space. Yeah, we wow. picked on Friday too, and that was really convenient. But really, the convenient. Fact that it was on the on the trade show floor. That's really helpful. I mean, I, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it really, honestly, is. Yeah, and I know they're. I know that they're taking up very valuable real estate with that that PCA booth. But I thought that was. I thought that was a great idea. I, yeah, I, I did too. too. I, I did yeah. too. Huge and they plug. utilized it right. I mean, I thought the products displayed they were good, and how they had the events there later on. I think that was a very good thing they did. But a real negative is after the first day they didn't have any uh, pumpkin bread in the back to steal. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think another thing that I would like them to see refine a little better is the way they do these PCA exclusives. Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't participate this year because it was just a little bit convoluted in the way it was working in the beginning. And by the time I understood what was going on, I was almost too late for me to do it. And honestly, I don't think had I done it, it would have made a difference for me as a company. But I, I like to see them figure out a little bit better way to do that. Because I think the concept is good. 
I just think they need to figure out a way to have, make it have more impact. Yeah, I agree. All right. So how about uh, not must haves, but maybe just wish list items for the future? You know, lower priority things, maybe, you know, things make things a little more convenient. No, it's, it's always the transparency thing for me. Just yeah. dumb it down for people. Like, it's really easy for them to just spell it out. Why, like I said earlier, why we can't go anywhere to do a show. Yeah. I mean, the survey today was great because I was just, you know, one click, but it would have been nice to be able to read something. Just like, what do you prefer? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree that the, the list versus the number of RFPs we put out in the list. I mean, for example, and I don't think I'm spilling too many beans. You know, we had an option to do it at Tampa, but uh, the space is limited. The big deal problem with Tampa was the only dates available were in the middle of October. And who wants to have a trade show in October where you ship product in February? Um, but the thing so is, the thing I is, wish, when you share that, know. Jay, that takes the Tampa thing right off, right? As soon as you say, oh, we tried Tampa, but the only days we can get in Tampa are October. Everybody goes, okay, Tampa isn't an option. We yeah, all yeah, see, that. You were see, see, just product. said that. Like you, I, you, you, you said it perfectly, Jay, and, and Steve landed on it. Absolutely correct. You never told anybody. Well, you that's just didn't even of, tell people. <laughs> it's part of the problem with the organization, in my opinion, and I'm probably going to get screamed at tomorrow, but I don't care, is I'm always the guy pounding my fist on the desk saying, just communicate it to people and people will understand. And there, there is momentum to have more and more disclosure, but we are still, like my brother is just up in arms that uh, board meetings cannot be attended virtually or personally by, by members of the PCA. Uh, most boards, you know, usually your members have the right to attend part of the meetings. Right. So I think things, this is not 1933. We need to have more transparency. And honestly, I think if people attended and they understood some of the challenges they have, there'd be a lot more understanding as to why we're making the decisions we're doing. And I think Scott's doing a good job on the communication, but we do need to improve on that more and more. And, you know, I can't speak for him, but I think he'd agree with me. Um, we thought, sorry, go John. you go, John. We thought the uh, media session was great. Uh, a lot of what we're talking about right now was actually discussed at the media session. Um, if, it, if there's a possibility to move it up in terms of uh, time start, because uh, again, that kind of leads back into us being um, time constrained on the floor. So if there's any way to start at a half an hour before the show opens or even an hour before the show opens, uh, that would certainly be my preference. And I think uh, quite a number of the larger media brands would, would probably agree with that because you know, any, any time that uh, takes us away from the showroom floor is, is, is eating into our availability. But uh, overall, again, it's, we're just talking incremental improvements, not a pitch session. So I thought the session was, was great. I would say, actually say, I prefer not to have it during the trade show at all. I prefer to have it a week after the trade show. Virtually. Yeah. Um, just because uh, I think in the middle of it, a lot of questions are kind of everybody's running around doing things. There's not really a lot of information they can share, like on attendance numbers, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think post uh, trade show, uh, that's, that would be the survey that you send to the media. We could just handle it in that kind of a, that kind of a scenario. I think that would yeah. probably work better. Let me ask you, do you get a copy? Do you get that Excel spreadsheet with all the people that were, that had badges that were retailers? Do they send that to you? Yeah, yeah we get that. Yeah, I get it. And, uh, and I, we never know, it. I never know if it's authentic or not. You know what well, I mean? Well, I get I get it from Aaron. Uh, I think it's Aaron, whoever who's whoever's part of the PCA board. But I get about eight thousand spam emails a, a year of someone trying to sell me that oh, information. Based, I know. Yeah. Uh, two two areas I would say improve on are if you're going to do a Fuente Friday seminar. I know it's tough to work sometimes to do it, but you gotta you gotta nail that down ninety days before the trade show. Same with the PCA exclusives. Pete, you did have your thing ninety days beforehand, but I think if you had those things ninety days, someone who's on the fence may may make that decision much quicker than announcing it within thirty days. Well, so, Coop, so. Let, let me retort on that. I think we talk about apathy of consumers and and retailers. There is a lot of apathy for manufacturers. It was. I won't even say it was hurting cats to get the manufacturers to actually get off their asses and to get back to us, to return phone calls, emails. I'm shocked that we had any exclusives at all. There were other here's the, here's the I know the feeling. <laughs> here's the way it works, Jay. 
if you give us a hard deadline and we don't meet it, then you can't have them. that. That to me, enforce yeah, the deadline. Yeah. Um, then you would have had no exclusives this year. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Uh, the PCA needs to do a better job, but honestly, the I think the thing I, is, Jay, they would need to like tell us now what the deadline is because every year we know when the trade show is, and we're all still scrambling at the last. I literally, I had Anna fly down to Nicaragua the weekend before to pick up stupid display boxes for Stillwell Star. You know what I mean? So we're <laughs> always running behind. Every year we know when it is. So yeah, you got you got you got to give us hard deadlines, or we're 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 as bad as everybody else. We're not special. Yeah. Good. You I mean, <laughs> hard now and then send a reminder every month until the deadline's over. That's literally exactly what you have to do. That's what you do have to do. Yeah. Sad that you do, but yeah, and you're you're just, yeah. you have so many fires all the time. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think one thing that that we did not do well as an organization last year is a lot of our subcommittees did not meet until like October, November, because there were so many things we were trying to catch up from last year. Um, this year, we're going to be more ahead of it. And I agree, we can do a better job by setting hard deadlines. Um, but, you know, Coop brought it up a couple of times about, you know, manufacturers sponsoring this and that, you know, you guys are, are engaged and there are a number of manufacturers, but a lot of manufacturers, quite frankly, are not engaged. They don't want to contribute. They don't want to do sponsorships. And if you, you just ask Eric Espinosa or ask Crown Heads, it has benefits. It's huge. I mean, look at Eric the last two years, the benefits of him sponsoring and how that's helped his show grow. Let me uh, say this. I'm someone who has never sponsored anything at the PCA, but I've always advertised. So I spend my dollars in the advertising dollars, right? And that's how I end up earning a lot of my points is because I advertise on all the PCA publications. And so, I mean, there, there are different ways that you can do it. Yeah, you're right. There. Yeah. You know, and I would say that despite sometimes acting like you're not behind the PCA, you're actually one of the more ardent supporters of the PCA, Steve, and you do a lot to support us and it's very appreciated. Yeah, but maybe even if someone like does um, that sponsorship outside the trade show, throw them something at the trade show. It could be a small thing, right? That really won't cost them a lot of money. You know, throw them a billboard or something out there. You know, they used to have the product cases when you walked in. Put the, yeah, say if someone's contributed this amount throughout the year, you do that. I, I think those little things would go a long way. This is just for I, Jay, for thought. There's avenues of sponsorship that you don't necessarily have to relate to manufacturers in this industry. There are many companies who interact and benefit greatly from our industry, whether it be people related around the liquor industry, whether it be people, huge. the shipping people, UPS, FedEx, all those guys. There are ways to get sponsorships for stuff that doesn't necessarily have to be from people within our industry. There's a lot of organizations that benefit greatly from the work that we do every day. I think that avenue should definitely be looked at. Yeah. That's, I've, always said, I'd, I'd, I've always said I'd like to see some liquor at the trade show because so many of our customers operate the cigar bar model. As an industry, what we're spending between UPS and 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 you know USPS, I mean, at least UPS, God knows this industry is spending a boatload of money with them. You know, yeah. it, 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 there's definitely some other sponsorship venues which should help create a hopefully a better trade show. I, I agree. The, the liquor is a little challenging because of the way the Sands does it. But yeah, there are other um, satellite industries that I think we could definitely do more with. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I also think that's some of the flexibility that if we do end up at NOLA at a traditional convention center, it opens up some of those things where you're not locked into the catering services of the hotel like you are at the Sands Expo Center. So yeah. I, I can see the limitation at Sands. Sands. Sands comes with its own benefits, but it also comes with its own downsides. Yeah, I'm thinking we could do like a GoFundMe for liquor for, for Pete Johnson and Steve Saka and <laughs> you know, I contribute to it. Dude, Listen, man, I, I looked at the catering for the trade show, and like Steve said, like, come on, man. Yeah, like, yeah. it was like eighty dollars for a Caesar salad. Yeah. <laughs> what the, what the heck is that? It's insanity. It's, wow. it's it's insanity how much it is. I mean, we, you know, we have we have we have lunch catered in because there's no time for my people to go out during the day, and I would say that like I think like four pizzas was something like almost two hundred and eighty five dollars for four pizzas. Wow, I mean, it, it is really wow. crazy. And that's why I'm always amazed when I see someone like Rocky doing something. He's spending real money when he's serving something off the Sands Expo floor. To, I mean, it's literally into the tens of thousands of dollars. There's just no way around it. 
Uh, any other topics that we hadn't talked about that you guys wanted to bring up before we put a wrap on this one? Um, well, I, I don't want to talk about it, but I want to. I I I actually want to touch on it a little bit. Someone mentioned COVID. Okay. And yeah. And I, I'd like to hear everybody's opinion, but. I don't think we we can blame the PCA for no. any of this. No, this no. is no. just to blame our organization for not doing it. What, how do you not do anything? I mean, you, you can't do something for something you don't see. Right. You know, like I don't I don't understand the like, bashing of it. So, like at our booth, Chris Duque got COVID, right? Yeah, but none of the rest of us got it. So did all the Chris, Hawaii guys got it, <laughs> right? So did they get it on the plane flight home? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, because Chris was handing me cigars the entire four days. He was handing me coffee. He was doing this. He was doing that. So I was, I mean, short of, so I mean, I, I don't know. I just think that this is just going to be part of the norm for the next who knows however long. I don't, I don't think you can blame the PCA for the COVID. No, not at all. I and think then, the extent, like, I think the extent of the PCA's involvement should, when people had said that they were getting sick was just an email to all the members saying people have been reporting that they've gotten sick. Do your due diligence. Uh, you know, test whatever you need to do, but uh, just just an email out to the group. That's it. There's not there's nothing else they could have done in that instance. An email you and Coop feel better. Than okay, they Abe, can I have John answer that question? Why that was important? Everybody, knew people had it. Okay, that but I I understand news it. News to any single person there. Now I can understand as an organization how you should say. All right, well, maybe an email wouldn't have hurt because you're right, people should know. But what I'm trying to say is between all the posts and everybody communicating and everybody talking about it, there was no secret that some people got it and what it was out there. But then to go out and publicly talk about it and make it because I'm going to tell you, Coop, because Coop and I kind of talked about a little bit of this about KMA, I just felt it was a little bit of attack. And I don't think anybody should be attacked when it comes to this matter in this case. This is the world we live in. If you're going yeah. out, look, you're going to be exposed, you have the possibility of being exposed. And you should act accordingly. You know, you should you should act accordingly because you cannot sit here and say, I'm going to live my life dependent on every organization filtering me all the data and information from everywhere I go. It's just kind of an unrealistic standard, in my opinion. You're going out to public, you're going to a trade show. If you don't think there's a possibility that you possibly could be exposed to a, a cold or a virus and something that's out there, then you're not living in the real world. And the fact that it really wasn't secret I mean, there was hundreds of posts. I got COVID. Hey, I got COVID. Everybody kind of, we know. I saw like five of them oh, at back. But, but okay, John, you are in Canada. Explain why it was important to have an email. Yeah, so th there is ramifications. For, I mean, I know in America, you know, you can get on a plane. It's no big deal. Uh, everything's good. Uh, there are ramifications for international travelers. Uh, you know, I have it fairly light because Canada, U.S. right now, getting along fairly well. So it's not a huge deal. Um, but I know that there's disclosure forms that I have to make uh, and I have to be honest on those disclosure forms about. So, you know, one of the things that it, it is helpful just to have a, a simple communication. I don't think it needs to be very complex. I think it just exactly. has to say, hey, there's been a report of this and that's it. And I don't think that, you know, I know it's a, a very um, no-win situation for the PCA and I don't think the PCA needs to take on any more than they already do. Uh, I think just a simple email communication to say, we've had reports of this, that's it. Uh, I don't even think they need to go to the extent of saying you need to do this or you should do this. We've had reports of this, that's it. Yep, um, that's it. Because, because like I said, I think for, for, I know for people traveling back to Europe, um, there's almost certainly going to be ramifications where they have to make disclosures upon landing, which is going to result in, in uh, quarantine procedures in the country that they go back to and they have to, uh, they have to disclose that. So that is, that is something for international travelers to take when into account. Coop keeps going to John to be a savior, but I just traveled. In but, but that's, yeah, I'll, but I understand that a, but it's just, an individual you, case. No, I get it. Once again, I'm not saying that it's not valid. They do right. But the way you brought it out there seemed like it was a criticism. And we, we had discussion. It wasn't a criticism. Anyway, that was not a criticism. This was, okay, this is something a little more constructive. Why, why, why shouldn't I have said something is my question. Listen to, me. The story, listen to me. You could have said something. You could have been the news. You could have been the, the news railing me, media. But your thing was a story that's not being discussed. Let me ask you this. Does anyone know of anyone that has gotten a severe case of COVID? If where they've had real ramifications for it? Because everything I've heard from... Everything oh, I from this show? From the yeah, show? And mild symptoms and 
most of them have been three, four. No, days. we're in we're in the seventh wave, so theoretically, no one should be getting. Yeah, I mean, really I know some people were pretty sick for a couple of days, but no one had to go to the hospital. Someone almost I know had to go to the hospital. I think at this point, if you're going to a place where thousands, forget about just our industry, right? The thousands of people from our industry, we were exposed to where hundreds of thousands of people are coming from all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's a safe assumption without an email to say that you may have been exposed to COVID. I really do. I think Anna, Anna came back from Nicaragua with COVID. That's why she didn't come to the trade show. I mean, look, she, she lives in Nika. We travel to Nika almost every month, and this is the one trip, my gosh, she ends up coming back with COVID. Why? You know? Weird for you to know whether you may have been exposed during COVID to COVID when you go to Vegas at the show. That's the point I'm trying to make. I think it's just... yeah. yeah. A little too much. As adults, as grown people working in the civilized world, if you're going to a trade show that's our own show is made up of thousands of people, and then you have hundreds of thousands of people coming from all over the world, if you need an email to tell you that you may have been exposed to COVID, it's ridiculous. In my personal opinion at that point. Not when there's a couple hundred people who get it. I disagree with you on that. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's cool. cool. Abe's right on this one because the amount of times I sat down at a slot machine. Yes. That that yeah. someone that wasn't in our industry that was playing before me, and I put my cigar up to my mouth after I touched the slot button, I could have got it from anybody. I didn't catch it. And here's I got the funny a bug. part. I think about this all the time because I mean I've been traveling nonstop since September of 2020. Okay, so I did not go into strict pro, you know COVID kind of protocols, and amazingly, I haven't gotten COVID. I don't even know how that's possible. Because I've been to three trade shows since, and I've been to Nika most every month. And Lagavulin, Lagavulin prevents the yeah. uh, the infection. <laughs> well, I think well, so. Maybe that's the case. I don't know what it is, but it is, it is very arbitrary who does and who doesn't. Because I have other friends that have caught it. Through. I have one friend that's now on his fourth time going positive in two years. Yeah. It it's is crazy. Yeah. I, I know anyone came to the media compound. I alerted the other people that that they had COVID. So cool. I mean, I did. I, that's what I just did because they yeah. were at a place. I just wanted them. To, it took to it took less than it took less than five minutes. Coop, you acted like a responsible adult. You, you know, if I know I got it and I was around people, I'm telling the people I know I've been around in the last. Of course, year, there it is. That's what I'm doing. Responsible adult. What I'm saying is, I don't believe, and I don't think it's really even a big deal whether an email was sent out from the PCA or not, because. If you're going to Vegas where hundreds of thousands of people, you just have to automatically, with or without an email, assume that you're going to have been exposed. There's just no way, statistically. There's no way. You don't need people to actually catch it and talk about it. You just have to operate like, hey, I just went to a trade show. There's thousands of people. I'm going to come back. Listen, George Rico, perfect example. George Rico, I said, listen, I haven't ordered his product or sold it in my store now for years, but we're still friends. Right. I only sat on him on day three and I, I talked to him for about an hour, me and him just talking, shooting the shit. Right. His wife, when he comes back from any trip he makes, makes him go stay at their beach house or whatever it is for two weeks until he can come home to the kids. He doesn't need an email. He didn't need to be notified that people had it. He's traveled. He's went out in the public. He's went where hundreds of thousands of people is. They're operating under the assumption he got exposed. And, and that's the way the world needs to work. This I got an email and they, no man, it's, it's it's this is the world we live in today. So I, listen, I'm not taking away from your feelings that an email should have been sent out. What I'm saying is I don't think that's the story. I don't think that's anything on the PC. And the fact that they didn't send it out, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think is any relevance at all because yeah, but they're knowing. I, if I'm going to Vegas, hundred thousand people, I know without a doubt. That at some point I probably sat somewhere, sat next to, gambled next to somebody, or or got served by a hostess who probably had it at some point. So when I come home, I literally did. I tested just a quick PCR just to make sure I had no symptoms. But I got to go to work where I have thirty some employees. Why expose them? Exactly what we all did. We all tested too. It's possible that I tested myself real quickly, even though I had no symptoms. Showed negative and went to work. That's that's where i'm coming from on all this so pete question for you yeah and it's the last thing i'll say you talked about transparency yeah wouldn't this yeah, be but transparency hey the pca cares i mean this is just kind of building up more trust here is what i'm just saying yeah but wouldn't when, when did the pca when did the pca know 
that people got COVID when everybody got home and started posting no, on Facebook? No, no, they didn't. No, they they would. No, I'm I'm curious. I don't know. Um, I'm gonna, because I I, 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 I don't want to give out. I don't want to give out names. I don't want to give out names. I don't feel well, but I I tested again. I tested six yeah. times, five rapids, yeah. and one PCR were yeah. all negative. But I still had yeah. a bug for two days. Uh, we'll talk offline because I can tell you they knew by the time we were in the press conference. What what day was that? Monday. Okay. Well, there there were there were people that had actually made decisions to fly home on Monday based on a positive result from yeah, Sunday. There was, so. there was there were booths that closed up based on this. But you can't stem, you can't stem it from the show. Again, and, what Abe said. And and I don't, and I don't think is, if I a, if I could, I'll maybe Abe makes some good points. But what I'll say is, but I, I like the fact game, that PCA why, why cares. Yeah. PCA cares. Yeah. Right. Wouldn't that just be hey, you know, what's what, how much effort does it take to do that? I mean, yeah, I'm it doesn't take of, much effort. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I agree understand what Abe's saying. Abe's not wrong on what he said. I understand what Abe's saying. But I think you also have to think about it from the point of if the PCA announces it in that way. It's almost like they're saying we were a super spreader of that. We're the yeah. why. You know what I mean? Well, you no, but most, I mean, most of the manufacturers that got home that had it actually made sure that they posted on social media that they just got back from the super spreader. Yeah. Okay. I went to a large event in Nashville and they announced it. So, Listen, I mean, I'm just saying I'm, it was a cigar event, but I mean, they announced it and I appreciate when, it. When was that though? Uh, it was April 15th, right before Easter weekend. Okay. I don't think anybody going to the show ever thought there would be a, another wave coming through. Well, no, I don't think anyone did it because last year we didn't have the issue <laughs> and it was a wave right after it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I actually knew going in that, that we were right at the smack dab at the beginning of the wave. And like you said, like it, to Abe's point, I did take that into account, but there's a difference yeah. between thinking something and knowing something and the point where it goes from thinking something and suspecting something to knowing something. That's the point I think at which, you know, for, for me did, personally, did you mention it to the PCA at the media conference? Like, hey, you guys should it was probably right do after something. I started, it was yeah. right after it, I found out. So I was already out of the media. Send out an email to the, you know, to your, 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 uh, your retail members and say, hey, there have been cases reported. We don't know where it started from, but just be aware and if be Coop careful. Knew, if Coop knew at the point, 100%, he would run up in that meeting, I'm sure. You know, just knowing Coop, he would have yeah, said so. It would have absolutely been brought up in the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. he didn't I, know I, at I that bl- point. I blame the media. <laughs> I blame the media. No, yeah, I would have brought it up in the media. But like I said, um, yeah, they there was – it was – yeah, they knew. All right, other topics. Did Stevie, did you have something else that you wanted to bring up? Okay. I'm uh, good. I, I do have a topic. Okay, Jay. <laughs> The I'm not coming to the media compound next year unless you have mistress. <laughs> Mistresses? Yes. Mistress. <laughs> we, we are we are happy to entertain sponsors. Maybe we get yeah, yeah, we're happy to entertain that. sponsors for mistress. He said mistress. <laughs> it's not what I heard. Uh yeah. I, I, I will I'll sponsor fifty dollars towards a mister because uh it was a little warm that last night when Luciano was there. Oof. Listen. Sure. It was way cooler than it was last year. That's last all. Last year say. was absolutely. Yes. I could tell you. About last, last year's year. experience made me not go this year. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I <didn't laughs> know died last year. The guy last was, year was blazing. The sweat it, coming it, off of you last oh year. Oh my god! It was 109 in Dallas today with a heat index of 116. Uh, oh. Brutal. Yeah. Well, we could always look forward to New Orleans in April. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's a wrap for tonight. Uh, I want to thank Steve, Pete, Jay, Will, Abe. We appreciate your time so much. I know just getting back from the trade show, uh, you're running like crazy dealing with stuff post-show. We really appreciate you taking some time tonight to talk about the trade show and um, your opinions are always greatly appreciated. So from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, Thank you. I want to thank everybody that was watching, everybody that's going to watch after, listen on podcasts. We really appreciate that. Um, and, uh, yeah, great show. Uh, we can't t- wait to do it again next year. Thank you all. And, uh, we'll see you on the next show. Peace.